Okay. All right, good morning and welcome to uh, the City Council's eighth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Youth Services, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Debbie Rose. We're also joined by several of my colleagues, Councilmember Margaret Chin, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, uh, Councilmember Keith Powers, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmembers Matthew Eugene, and I know others will be joining us later. Today we will hear from the Department of Youth and Community Development, the Department of Small Business Services, and the Department of Health and Mental, Health, Mental Hygiene. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director, LaTanya McKinney, Committee Councils Rebecca Chasen, Noah Brick, and Stephanie Ruiz, Deputy Directors Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Heads Isha Wright and Krillian Francisco, Finance Analyst Michelle Peregrin, uh, Ali Ali, and Lauren Hunt, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the Department of Youth and Community Development. We are pleased that there is an agreement to restore 5,000 slots in the Summer Youth Employment Programs, or SYEP, and 6,000 slots in the Comprehensive After School System, or COMPASS. However, there are approximately 500,000 students in kindergarten through fifth grade enrolled in DOE schools, but DYCD has slots for only 9% 9, 9 of these students in COMPASS. In our preliminary budget response, the Council called on the Administration to invest $90 million to redesign and expand the Compass Elementary Program from 47,000 to 100,000 slots. We called for the introduction of a sliding scale fee based on family income to support program expansion and help diversify the mix of programs offered during after school hours. We also called on the Administration to ensure that in the new contract, the price per participant is raised to support the full cost of services. At our preliminary budget hearings, we asked DYCD where demand for Compass Elementary programming was greatest and we were told that while providers collect application data, DYCD didn't have that information. Failing to collect information about demand for services doesn't make that unmet demand go away. We call on the administration to get serious about identifying and funding unmet need. Committing $90 million would be an important start. Similarly, the Council is frustrated that the, administrators, that the administration didn't baseline $19 million for the Work, Learn, and Grow employment program. Our frustration continues with the administration's failure to include $15 million to fund schools out in New York City, or Sonic, for middle school students in the summer. Parents of middle school aged children don't have a seasonal need for after school care. Programs for the city's kids should not be used as a bargaining chip in our annual budget negotiations. It's extreme bad faith. While we are hopeful that the administration will ultimately add this money back by adoption, this delay will wreak havoc on providers who again will have mere weeks to implement quality programs for the city's middle school students. Um, before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chair, council member Debbie Rose, for her statement, and then we will hear from DYC Commissioner Bill Chong. Thank you, Chair Drum, and good morning. Good morning to everyone. I am Council Member Debbie Rose, Chair of the Committee on Youth Services, and I'm really pleased to be joined here by my fellow Council Members who have been acknowledged by Chair Drum. I'd also like to acknowledge the young people that are here today. Thank you for being here. And we will hear today from DYCD Commissioner Bill Chung, Associate Commissioner J Jadim Fanor, along with the agency's team of program-specific deputy and assistant 
associate commissioners. Thank you all for joining us. When we were here last, we discussed the shortfalls in DYCD's $755 million preliminary budget for fiscal year 2020. The executive budget totals $779.2 million, approximately a $24 million increase. The executive budget includes two new needs, $26 million for the upcoming census 2020 work, and the other, a $2 million baseline increase for NYCHA Community Center Maintenance. Additional funding for programmatic support came from the Office of Economic Opportunity for the newly launched Advance and Earn program, formerly the, Youth, the Young Adult Internship Program, or YAIP, and the Young Adult Literacy Program, YALP. The agency was tasked with hitting its $11.5 million peg target, of which they landed on $12.1 million for this peg, $600,000 above the target from OMB. Chair Drum touched on the fiscal 2019 one-shot restorations, one for $6.2 million, supporting approximately 6,000 Compass Elementary slots and the other 11.9 million for 5,000 additional SYEP slots. This was encouraging since the executive budget included a combined PEG savings of 5.5 million from Sonic and Compass programs. Overall though, this leaves some of Sonic unfunded at $15 million in the Council's Work, Learn, Grow program without $19 million in funding for fiscal year 2020. Both issues raised at our last hearing and in the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response in April, both of which we stated were a priority for the council. For the thousands of children and working families my colleagues and I each represent, the services we consistently fight for at these hearings, SYEP, Compass, Sonic, and runaway and homeless youth are crucial to their daily lives. This administration may try to dismiss summer programming as secondary, but its benefits stretch beyond the short-term aid they provide to working parents and caregivers who need to know that their children are safe and healthy during the day. Even a few hours a day of structured activities can reduce the effects of summer learning loss for students. And this administration puts a lot of money in the value of early childhood learning. And for it to not be um, reciprocated at the adolescent um, end of the range is something that I just can't um, fathom when we have documented proof that, um, that there is learning loss during the summer. And that's why we as the city have a responsibility to reach as many children as possible through our public summer programs. Before we begin, I would like to thank Christine Johnson, my chief of staff, Issa Rogers, my legislative and budget director, um, Christian Ravello, my legislative aide, Michelle Peregrine, financial analyst to the committee, Isha Wright, unit head, Paul Senegal, a counsel to the committee, Kevin Katowski, policy analyst to the committee, and Elizabeth Arts, our community engagement liaison. Thank you again, Chair Drum, and I look forward to a productive conversation at today's hearing. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank my staff member, Robin Forst, for sitting through this with me uh, all eight days so far. And I'd like to announce that we've been joined by Council Member Barry Grudenchik, and with that, I'll ask Council to swear in the panel. <coughs> Do you affirm that your testimony today will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Thank you. You may proceed. Um, good, uh, good morning. Um, before I give my formal remarks, I do want to make a few comments about Lou Fiddler, since this is the first hearing since his passing. And um, when I became commissioner in 2014, I had an opportunity to uh, talk to Lou in an event in Brooklyn. and walked across a crowded room of people wearing my eye patch, you know, and because I wanted to say something very important to him. And I said that 
If it wasn't for Lou Fiddler, I would not have an agency to be in charge of. Because without a doubt, he kept DYCD alive. Uh, for him to almost single-handedly fight to restore 40% of our budget for several years with the support of former uh, Speaker Quinn is truly remarkable. I mean, there were hundreds of programs that depended on that money. There were thousands of young people who have not had services to ho uh, for a homeless youth who have not had beds or young people who have not had uh, after school programs or young people who have not had summer jobs if it wasn't for Lou Fiddler. So I think we owe all of him a, a debt of gratitude that, you know, uh, history hopefully will judge him as truly the savior of DYCD and for young people. And um, he kept us alive on life support so we could thrive under this administration. So I just couldn't let this moment pass without, you know, s saying this because I think, you know, we all knew it, but I think it has to be for the record. Um, so um, good morning, uh, Chairman Drum and uh, Chair Chairwin Rose and members of the Finance and Youth Services Committee. I'm Bill Chong, Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined by Jadine Fanor, DYCD's Chief Financial Officer, Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services, and Andre White, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Workforce Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on DYCD's fiscal 2020 executive budget. As you, knew, as you know, due, due to uncertainty in our economic future, um, last month the mayor announced the administration's first ever mandatory savings program. Working closely with the Office of Management and Budget, we have carefully crafted a strategic savings plan totaling $12.3 million that is fiscally responsible and does not include any cuts to core services funded by DYCD. Although approximately 94% of DYCD's budget is dedicated directly to contracted services, we were able to achieve more than half of our savings target from outside our program budget. Our savings plan includes uh, $1.2 three million in rent savings from the consolidation of office space to two locations. 591,000 uh, from reduction in nine vacant positions across the agency. 250,000 in savings from office supplies, equipment, and other AOTPS expenses. And 4.7 million in revenue in prevention, in prevention funding through a partnership with the Administration for Children's Services. On the program side, we achieved 2.49 million in savings by right-sizing the elementary summer wraparound program. One o our other program savings are 3 million in funds used to open new sonic programs. DYCD's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget stands at 779.2 million, which does not include the 26.1 million in funding added following the, uh, the release of the executive budget. Thanks to the recent negotiations between the council and the mayor's office, the Summer Youth Employment Program will receive an additional $11.9 million, which will allow us to serve 75,000 young people this summer with a total budget of $162.3 million. Our, 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 our 195 new SYP contracts awarded through the recent request for proposal have begun, and providers have been, getting the, have been laying the groundwork for a successful summer program. This includes staff training in a variety of areas such as workforce development, project-based learning, and uh, program implementation. We're also offering extensive technical assistance on any issue that may arise. Additionally, we are pleased that $8 million was added to the adult literacy to enable us to continue to offer much-needed English language and civic classes, basic literacy instruction in reading, writing, and math, and high school equivalency prep courses. These funds will also uh, support strengthened professional development and teacher training as part of our efforts to build capacity in our providers. And $6.2 million was added to continue to provide Compass services. To help address the cost of repairs at Cornerstone Community Centers in NYCHA developments, the executive budget included $2 million. When added to the $1.9 million already in our budget, uh, the funding available for Cornerstone repairs will be also almost doubled to $3.9 million in FY20. We appreciate the Council's strong advocacy to help ensure that NYCHA community centers are in good condition and can be fully support the programs operated by the Cornerstone providers. The financial plan allows us to continue our remarkable, remarkable growth at, um, in services to runaway and homeless youth. In March, we uh, re reported 625 
uh, open beds with 120 remaining. Today we are reporting 33 additional beds or, since March for a total of 650 beds online with 95 remaining. We are on track to have all 753 beds online within the next few months, which will fill the mayor's uh, com total commitment of 500 new beds for ages, uh, young people ages 16 to 20. We also, we also like to report that our progress toward the goal of serving homeless young adults ages 21 to 24 in the, run the new runaway and homeless youth program, residential programs. Responding to the new funding in the adopted budget, DYCD issued an RFP for uh, homeless youth adults uh, programs in August, and all, and all 60 beds have been awarded to providers in the fall. Uh, four new programs have been co contracted, and all will be online as soon as state certification is completed. Finally, the budget adds $26 million to assist the city's efforts to ensure that every New Yorker is counted in the 2020 census. We look forward to supporting the efforts by providing administrative back office and procurement support to the census office and lending our expertise to the city's outreach strategies as they, as they roll out. Under the leadership of Deputy Mayor Thompson and Director of the Census, Julie Menon, the funding will be um, be, be used to encourage every New York resident to participate in the upcoming 2020 census. As an accurate census count will ensure that New York receives its fair share of education, health care, housing, and infrastructure funding, and uh, its proper electoral representation in Congress. Have you, as you have heard in my testimony today, despite budget uncertainties, FY, the FY 2020 executive budget continues to place DYC in a very strong position to fund quality programs that improve lives and create opportunities to advance socio socioeconomically. We look forward to continuing to work with the City Council to support New York City's young youth, families, and communities. Thank you again for our chance to testify today, and we're ready to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. And uh, thanks for your salute to Lou Fiddler as well. I think we, we all agree on that. Um, in our fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response, the council called on the administration to baseline, to baseline money or restore the fiscal 2019 one-shots for core programs that otherwise get funded on a year one-year basis through the annual budget dance. For fiscal 2020, we asked for 11.9 million for 5,000 summer youth employment program slots and 6.2 million for 6,000 Compass elementary slots. While funding restor restorations were announced immediately prior to our hearing with OMB, still outstanding are the unfunded needs of $15 million for Summer Sonic and $19 million for Work, Learn, and Grow. We all recognize the importance of these programs and the council expects to see these funds included in, in the adopted budget. So what are your recommendations as an agency for how we might avoid delayed funding again in the future so as to prov protect the interests of youth families and providers? Well, let me say, first of all, uh, thank you for getting an early decision on the uh, adult literacy and the uh, COMPASS programs and SYP. You know, early is always better. Uh, and I've said that uh, about all our core programs, early is always better. Um, I understand the importance of the Sonic Summer uh, services as well as the Work, Learn, and Grow. Um, I expect that it will be continue to be part of the uh, conversation as we move towards adopted. And I always, as I've said, early is always better for core programs. Uh, we understand the challenges of late funding, uh, and we'll continue to you know, advocate for those uh, going forward. So I'll tell you off, um, you know. Uh, one of the number one priorities for the council moving forward is Summer Sonic. Um, that has always been, and, and I'm not going to give away any secrets about what we talk about in BNT, <laughs> but it is definitely one of our top, top priorities. So we look forward to continuing those negotiations with the administration. And we appreciate your support. Okay, thank you. There are approximately 500,000 students in kindergarten through fifth grade enrolled in DOE schools, but DYCD has slots for only 9% of those students in Compass, leaving many students without after-school services. In our preliminary budget response, the council called on the administration to invest $90 million to redesign and expand the Compass Elementary program from 47,000 to 100,000 slots. This recommendation to expand the program was not included in the executive budget. During the preliminary budget hearing for DYCD, the associate commissioner testified that DYCD knows what the scaling inputs are 
who the partners are, and all of the stakeholders. Can we expect to see a completed cost analysis by the close of the fiscal year? Let me first uh, sort of restate what I said of the preliminary budget. Uh, in the perfect world, if the funding was there, I think everyone would agree that a universal after school program would be great. But the funding is not there, so that is obviously one big challenge that, um, uh, that we face. Um, when you talk about universal, it's, it's, a, it's complicated. It's how you define it. So is it a program in every school? Is it a program, a, a program seat for every young person who wants it? So the costs of how you calculate that are going to be uh, a challenging. Uh, I'm not sure we can do that analysis um, because there's 1.1 million young people in the school system. Um, how many would want an after-school seat? That's some, some of that is going to be speculative. Um, we will have a better sense going forward. We're launching this summer our universal application, which will allow the public for the first time to apply in one location online for all the different programs that we fund. Eventually, it's going to be an 18 to 20 month rollout. And so one of the features in this new online application, we call it Discover DYCD, is people can be put on multiple waiting lists. Uh, for different programs. So at some point in the future, um, I don't know exactly when, but sometime before the end of this administration, we can actually have real data as to how many people are on waiting lists. Because in the past, we couldn't do it. We didn't have a system to do it. So moving forward, we'll be in a better position to under understand what the true need is. Because otherwise, it is truly um, speculative. School to school. So we've seen in the Sonic um, programs, which are universal, that the uh, participation levels vary from school to school, depending on what else is happening in that school, what are the things that are happening in that community. So my goal is, before I leave as commissioner, is to be in a position where we can better understand what the true need is, and hopefully the money will be there at that point. So it seems to me that you're saying we're not going to be able to expect getting a report by the end of the fiscal year, but that with the um, introduction of this new portal, I guess, um, we would uh, get a better feel for what you think the need is? I think, you know, that we're, we're planning for the future because, you know, at some point, hopefully the economy will be more stable, we'll have more certainty, and whether it's under my tenure or in the next commissioner's tenure, there'll be at least the, 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 the kind of objective data that I think you need to make to, uh, you need to have, uh, you know, uh, firm budget decisions made. So we're planning for the future. I can't really commit to anything at, by the end of the fiscal year because it's all speculative at this point. So when do you think you'll have the results of the um, online applications? Um, I would say sometime in the, we're launching this summer, so sometime during, yeah, maybe at the end of FY20, we'll have a sense on the after school because uh, we have 46 different programs that we fund. So we're, we're uh, integrating different programs on a, uh, on a, uh, on a quarterly basis over the next uh, 18 to 20 months. So the after-school programs are the first ones to come online this summer, and so I'm hopeful that we'll have the waiting list data more clear by the end of the fiscal year. Okay. All right. So we look forward to getting that information and working with you on that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the census. Um, while we usually have focus on the youth services side of DYCD, I'd like to just uh, pivot and discuss the involvement of the agency's community development arm in the census 2020. Especially given the national political climate, this census is make or break for the city. It really is. My district in particular was undercounted. Um, I, I'm sure of it. Uh, we can see areas where we know that people were living and they just mark them as vacant buildings and it's just not true. Um, so the outreach to communities is vitally important. The executive budget includes $27 million from fiscal 2019 through fiscal 2021 for DYCD role in the census 2020. Of this funding, $22 million is for contracts, and the remaining $5 million is for 55 positions. Um, which city agencies are partnering on the census, and who is taking the lead? Um, since the money's in your budget, is it DYCD? Okay, so... Um I'll give you a two-part answer. I can talk about what DYCD is doing for the census, and then the money in our budget really is because we're a fiscal agent 
for the Census Office. And so any sort of policy questions, citywide policy questions, I suggest that um, uh, the council meet with Julie Menon. I know a meeting has been offered uh, with her and Deputy Mayor Thompson, so you can dig in more into the citywide issues. Um, we're just administering the money, uh, providing office space, providing you know the backup support. So we're the fiscal agent, uh, back office operation with that 26 million. I can tell you a little bit about our plans at DYCD, which don't uh, necessarily require more money, but just being uh, smart organizers. So. Since the beginning of the year, we've had the Census Bureau come and do presentations to all our contractors to, look, to talk about the job opportunities that are out there as the numerators and other positions so that our cons the constituents of the programs that we fund know about these jobs and they can apply for these jobs. Starting in, this, in July, uh, there will be many uh, work sites in the Summer Youth Employment Program that will focus on census outreach and we help to have a, a census action day at the end of the summer to get young people to kind of really make a big push uh, for the census, even though it's not till next spring. And then we're starting a planning process looking at our community centers to see which ones might be census uh, application places, because as you know, for the first time, the census will be done online. So we want to make uh, it as easy as possible for people uh, in, in underserved communities that would be uh, most at risk for being undercounted to have access to an online, uh, uh, to, to be able to apply online at, a, at a, whether it's a cornerstone or, or beacon. So those are some of the preliminary things we're looking at without any additional funding. And then we're, we still haven't figured out yet how we want to do a social message, social media messaging next spring to the young people who apply for the Summer Youth Employment Program because as you know, for the last 10 years or more, it's been an online application. And so we have email addresses for many young people. So we want to make sure, and young people have no problem doing anything online these days. So we want to make sure we tap into that resource as well for census. So that's our plan for DYCD. Anything else outside of DYCD, I suggest you, uh, Julie and the Deputy Mayor Thompson can give you more uh, a sense of the city's plans. So, Commissioner, one of the things in, 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 your, in your answer that does concern me a little bit is the fact that I don't believe that non-citizens can um, apply for those, most of the jobs um, that uh, the Census Bureau offers. Um, and, and so for us, the community outreach piece of it is vitally important. Uh, and then the, the funding that goes to community or CBOs um, is also really important uh, because they're the ones who have to have direct access into their own communities. So um, do you know how that contracting process is going to work? Um, will that go through your agency and how will those groups be um, selected? So we're going to end up doing the procurement, but the specifics haven't yet to be worked out with the Census Office, but because we do procurements fairly well, uh, we'll be mindful of the whole universe of nonprofits that work with uh, groups that historically have been underrepresented. So, uh, but I can't, I don't have anything more detailed to share, but we certainly are in conversations with Julie Men and her staff about the details. Okay. Um, I think that there'll still be a question on the census. Maybe you don't know, I'll ask Julie this, but um, that will uh, ask about same-sex couples, but not single LGBT folks. You don't know. Yeah, okay. Um, has DYCD onboarded the 15 census positions for which you recently received new funding uh, for fiscal 2019? Uh, Jadine, can you answer that? Hi, we've onboarded five. Five of the 15? Yes. When do you expect the, to bring the others on? Um, we're working with um, DC. With, we're working with the census to um, to finalize getting the other 15 on. And what are those positions? Um, we definitely don't have the details. Again, like the commissioner said, we are back office. We help facilitate if they have postings and different things. The five that are currently on board were hired before they um, moved to DYCD, so those positions have not yet been transferred to us. So we definitely don't have those de details. Would Julie Menon have that? Um, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so do you know the timeline for the actual work for the census when it starts and when it closes? 
No. Okay. All right. Let me let me go to NYCHA community centers. Uh, in the fiscal 2020, the executive budget adds $2 million in baseline increase for NYCHA cornerstone centers. How will this new funding be allocated among the 94 cornerstone NYCHA community centers? So, um, and I might ask Daryl to come up if I if you want more details, but. Um, I think this money was as a, the initial 1.9 million was added a year or two ago because uh, there are certain basic maintenance requ uh, uh, requests that we get from the uh, nonprofit providers. It might be painting, it might be plastering, it might be plumbing issues that are not capital related types of repairs. And so we work with the housing authority, we flag these on a case by case basis. So they're not allocated to any particular uh, center. And as the need comes in, uh, we de identify it to the housing authority, they make the repairs, and then we reimburse them. So what the additional $2 million will do is it will allow us to um, uh, fast track even more of these repairs so that the housing authority can focus on the repair work and then we'll reimburse them as, as it goes on. So it's not like we have a plan and this group gets X amount. It, it's a day-to-day, -day, -day, week-to-week, month-to-month, as, as challenges come in. We identify them. We have a, a dedicated staff person who works uh, every week in flagging these, and I get a, a report. Uh, in fact, all the senior staff get a report about progress of repairs at different centers. Who determines the priority for the repairs? Is it you or is it NYCHA? You have to identify yourself. Darrell Rattray, Associate Commissioner for Youth Services. I don't, I don't think your mic's on. Testing. Yeah. So Darrell Rattray, Associate Commissioner for Youth Services and Strategic Partnerships. I need to be sworn in. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you want to give me your hand. That's honest. <laughs> um, do you affirm that your testimony today will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So it, it's a combination. Um, of course, on the ground, we have our nonprofits who are at the centers. Based on what needs to be repaired, it may be something that's a pending violation for DOH. So that quickly comes to us. Or we assess it relatively quickly, and then we actually prioritize it for NYCHA. And that relationship with NYCHA is working well, or? It's coming along. It's coming along. Uh -huh. OK. Um, is, there, is there a backlog of repair requests? There, there are, I would say, in answering that twofold. One, of course, everyone knows about the ticket repair system. Mm -hmm. So there are small items that are within that system. And then the priority items, like the large items, so hypothetically, if there's a leak in the roof and part of the ceiling caves in, that's a priority item. We work with NYCHA. They get a vendor to come out and make that larger repair. But is there a backlog? Certainly. There are items that, small items that are within that ticketing system that we are working on. So th can this new maintenance money um, be applied to some of the backlog, or how does that work? I believe it can. We haven't sat down with NYCHA yet to go over how we are going to strategize around a new funding, but absolutely, it should be able to. Are there any restrictions on it, do you know? Not that I'm aware of, and, right, and as of right now, we, well, capital, anything capital um, isn't covered within that funding, but any small or large repairs that are within the realm of the center should be able to be covered. About how many um, providers contract with DYCD to do this type of work? So we have 94 Cornerstone locations. That is roughly 39 contractors. I need to confirm that for you. 39? Providers. Are there plans to bring on more providers? No, there are no plans to add any additional Cornerstone sites. With, do, do you think Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Let me clarify that. With the exception of Marcy is being currently renovated, um, the Creative Community Center at Marcy, and that, may be a corner, that will be a Cornerstone site when it comes on board. In addition, Gowanus is slated to be renovated, and when that comes online, that will be a Cornerstone. Okay, thank you. Um, does DYCD anticipate that the $4 million budgeted will be sufficient to cover the um, annual maintenance cost? As of right now, we believe it will, but of course, we are continuously assessing whether or not um, the funding meets the need, and we will definitely um, request additional if needed. 
and you're the point person on that? I, well, I have a point, I'm the point person for Cornerstone. I do have a point person for repairs and it's all hands on deck. Uh, okay. Um, I think that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Chair Rose, but before I do, we've been joined by Council Member Andy King. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. Um, and I, too, want to acknowledge and thank you, um, Commissioner Chung, for, uh, for, for reminding us about the vital role that Lou Fidler played here. And I, I think it would only be fitting if we took a moment of silence to, to recognize and acknowledge his, uh, his impact and his passing. Moment of silence, please. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, uh, it's good to see you back. Um, and um, in response to Summersonic, which uh, there's a common theme here, uh, is, is a priority of the council. Um, both these programs, Summersonic and Work, Learn, Grow, cost approximately $35 million to restore. $15 million for 22,800 summer sonic slots and $19.7 million for 4,350 work, learn, grow slots. The city's total fiscal 2020 expense budget is $92.5 billion. This $35 million is literally a fraction of the total cost at three thousandths of a percent of the total expense budget, or 5% of DYC's total fiscal 2020 executive budget, or even 11% of the total fiscal 2020 budget for COMPASS. So let's assume, for the sake of argument, that through the budget negotiation process, the Council and the Administration reach an agreement to restore 22,800 sonic slots for this summer that are currently unfunded. Could you just walk us through the steps that DYCD and its program providers would need to undertake to get programming up and running for the summer with potentially a month's notice? So Susan will uh, go into the details. Thank you. Yeah, uh, on, on, the, on the positive side, we have some experience um, getting this money out later in the year and um, and so do our providers so we have traditionally gone out immediately after the funding is um, secured and confirmed with a survey that uh, will ask providers hey this there's additional money for summer services who has the capacity to do this who who has young people you know demanding services for middle school summer we give them a couple of days to kind of take an assessment get back to us to the number they'd like contracted we see how that combination of responses fits into the available funding in the past, we've been able to do a pretty good job of, of you know, getting to the demand that providers have brought back. Um, then we'll give them confirmation about getting their funding and we'll immediately start working with finance and our ACO to get the contracting going. Um, we, you know, we've had funding for Sonic Summer at various points during the spring and we've, we've sort of got a plan for whenever it does come. With that timeline in mind, what share of the newly added Sonic programs um, uh, summit slots would you estimate providers would be likely to fill? We've seen, you know, we've seen the overwhelming majority of those seats um, be contracted and um, utilized by young people. So we have seen a pretty good uptake um, considering the challenges of funding it that late. I'm confident we, you know, we have a history of making the best out of that funding. And just sort of a key point is that the way the Sonic program is designed, it's very flexible. It's not a daily program. It's 108 hours over four weeks. So if the money comes in later, uh, the programs may start in mid to late July and run through the end of August. So we, one of the things we learned uh, in listening to the nonprofits was young people in middle school in the summertime want flexibility in their schedule. They're not going to show up every single day like an elementary program from 8 in the morning to 6 at night, which is, believe it or not, how we used to do those programs. And there are very few 12 and 13 year olds who I know want to be anywhere at 8 o'clock in the morning in the summertime. So in response to that feedback, 
we designed a program that's uh, more project-based, 108 hours, 108 hours over four weeks. So that gives us flexibility to start a sonic summer program later than, let's say, the first week of, Ju of July. So again, we've done this three years in a row, four years in a row, so there's a lot of experience. Um, would you say that this is the most efficient way to, to actually do this? Well, as I've said in the preliminary budget hearing, you know, my preference is to have stable funding for core programs. Um, if the existing programs are full day, if a partial summer sonic program costs 15 million for 22,800 slots, how much more would it cost to match these programs to the longer programs offered in beacons and cornerstones? We'd have to get back to you on that cost. Yeah, but, but uh, you know, I, I don't think we have a number. But the, the way the Sonic program was designed was because this is what the nonprofits told us. An all-day program wouldn't work because young people wouldn't be showing up from 8 in the morning to 6 at night. And even I think the, the programs in the beacons don't operate uh, a whole day. They, they also have flexibility. Because again, when you're a young adolescent um, and you have no school, uh, you're going to want to spend time with family, with friends, with other activities in the community. So we want, so the, 100, the 108 hours wasn't um, pulled out of thin air. It was based on a lot of feedback we got from providers of what made the most sense in the summer for young adolescents. Um, so will you, um, will you work to get that sure. number for us? Sure. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, with Work, Learn, Grow, since implementation of Work, Learn, Grow over the last four years, the average number of participants has been 5,781. And at the same time, the number of applicants has averaged about 15,112. As you can see, the demand for year-round jobs has outpaced the number of enrollees. Last year, through budget negotiations, the administration picked up the programs as a one-shot for $19 million. Given these facts, why hasn't the program been restored for fiscal 2020? And can we expect to see the program restored at adoption? Uh, as I said earlier, uh, obviously uh, it's an important program. And um, I'm certain that in the conversations between now and the adopted budget, this will certainly come up again. And, uh, we're, you know, has with the Sonic Summer, our workforce staff are extremely prepared and experienced in making sure this happens. We have a little bit more time because the program doesn't really start until October, so it's less of a time pressure situation. So it's a larger question about, you know, the back and forth negotiations that will happen between now and adopted. And so I'm sure uh, this will come up. Um, why was it cut? And the demand for work, loan, learn, grow clearly outpaces, um, you know, the, the enrollment outpaces. Well, as you know, commissioners don't make decisions on what gets cut in their budget mm -hmm. or what's, you know, not in a baseline. It's a larger conversation that I think you have to have with OMB because I think every agency, uh, if, the, if I was given the authority to fund what I wanted to fund, obviously it would be something, but it's a larger conversation about what, what can the city afford given the uh, fiscal uncertainty, so I'm sure this will be part of the ongoing conversation between now and the adopted budget, and uh, we appreciate the support of the council in making this program happen year to year. And uh, I appreciate hearing that the conversation is going to be ongoing um, because I know you recognize the value of this program continuing. Um, and. Uh, the, the restoration of a one-shot for this program. Um, summer Youth Employment. The Summer Youth Application deadline closed on April 25th, 2019. Can you provide the committee with the updated number of people who have applied per the new category under the Special Initiatives Programs area, which 27,000 slots had been earmarked for, including vulnerable youth, both older and younger, NYCHA MAP or MAP, both older and younger, general NYCHA, both older and younger, cure violence, both older and younger, and justice involved and foster care youth. So uh, Andre will give you the answer. Okay. 
So in total, we did receive over 146,000 applications for the special initiative option um, for vulnerable youth, older youth. We've received over 1,675 applications so far for younger youth, 473. For NYCHA MAP, 1,569 older youth application for younger youth, 752. SYP for NYCHA for older youth, 535. For younger youth, 220. For the sector focus option, we've received 466 applications. That's only for young people over age 16, so there's no younger youth component. Uh, for Cure Violence, we have received 73 older youth application and 19 application for, for younger youth. Thank you. And likewise, for the general population program area, which includes 43,000 slots within the new RFP, can you provide this committee with those numbers um, who have applied? Ab absolutely. For older youth, 90,543. Young people have applied and 33,645 young, young, um, younger youth. Okay. And will all the unfilled slots be rolled into the general lottery pool of slots if not filled under the school-based or special initiative category? That's the plan, yes. Okay. So all of those slots will be filled? Correct. Okay. Great. Um, the administration announced the, the restoration of 5,000 slots for a cost of $11.9 million, reflecting last year's fiscal 2019 one shot of $10 million.3 um, dollars, plus the increase for minimum wage adjustments. Will these 5,000 slots be added to the general lottery? The recent renamed community-based division within SYEP's program area? Yes, the additional 5,000 slots will be allocated to the community-based option, okay. only to yep. the community-based option. Only community-based. And will the disbursement of these 5,000 slots model the citywide distribution as outlined in the preliminary plan? Yes. Okay. Will these slots be allocated for older youth or young youth, or Old a combination of both? And what will the allotments be? Uh, our thinking currently is to only allocate to the older youth portfolio. Um, as you know, for the younger youth portion, those young people are going to be engaged in projects and providers need at least two to three months to really plan and execute their projects. Um, we're not sure if providers could take an additional younger youth slots because there might not be enough time to plan the additional projects that they might have to offer the young people. So the thinking now is community-based older youth, but if there are some younger youth providers that might be able to develop additional projects for younger youth, we might consider that as well. Have all of the baseline 70,000 slots been filled? At preliminary, there were approximately 3,600 unfilled slots. So um, circling around, you know, back around on these, you know, specifically. Mm -hmm. Yes, so once the, the, the awards were made for the RFP, we're actually, what we, we're in the amendment process right now. So essentially what we're doing, we are talking to providers to determine capacity. And based on the capacity responses we're getting in terms of the number of slots they could take on, we're allocating those additional 3,000 slots that you're referring to. Have you added any additional contracts? No. No. What are the total number of contracts that you have to date? 195, 195 contracts. Um, and you are working toward um, increasing the contracts, the number of contracts? We just awarded, as you know, we just released the RFP mm -hmm. last year. Um, these contracts will be in place for three years with an additional renewal, renewal option for three years. Okay. Um, advance and earn or bridge programs. Uh, I see um, we have some supporters here for bridge programs. DYC, uh, DYCD released the advance and earn RFP on May 1st, 2019. After many shifted release dates, the pre-proposal conference was yesterday, actually, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, the budget for advance and earn is just over $13 million for 900 slots, which covers a robust continuum of services. In the RFP and concept paper, this program is described as a bridge program, correct? With bridge elements, correct. Okay. 
In the Council's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response, we called on the administration to increase their recommended funding level from 60 million annually to 70 million in fiscal 2020 for bridge programs. Is this allotment of funding a portion of this so-called funding for bridge programs? The advance and earn funding is actually, um, it's actually through New York City Opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones who work closer with us to design the model and fund the actual program. Um, and so the advocates are, are calling for an increased level of slots to align with the service level in fiscal 2019 between the Young Adult Literacy Program and the Intern and Earn uh, programs, um, which uh, this sort of replaced, did it not? Well, as you cited in your uh, initial te testimony, the money for uh, Advance and Earn was added on an annual basis, as it has been for the last 10 years by the Office of Economic Opportunity. So uh, we can pass on your request to find out um, where the remaining funds that were represent the combined uh, young adults and literacy and intern and earn, mm -hmm. and, and whether that money is available to expand, advance, and earn. Uh, we can't answer that question because the money is not in our budget. It add, it's added in executive mm -hmm. on an annual basis, so they have a budget, so we'll pass on your request to them. Um, what number of participants did you have for these combined programs? We uh, had about 2,400. Uh, 2,200 young people. 2,200. And how much funding for capacity building is in each advance and earn contract? How many contracts can, cur uh, can the current funding provide? And how can you envision a scaled up number of contracts through an increase in funding? So right now we have allocated $250,000 towards TA, and that's not per contract, that's for the entire portfolio. Um, as you know, with any new model, you have to do um, strong assessments to see exactly what the need is gonna be and what resources providers might be. So, uh, might need, sorry. So once those awards are made, we're gonna start that process. And given that young adults out of school, out of work rates and service providers are not evenly spread between neighborhoods, how do you plan to implement this program in a way which expands these services into um, high needs, additional high need areas? Um, as you know, most of DYCD programs are actually located in communities where there are high needs, right? Um, with, with this particular program, what is important to us is to make sure that we're developing trainings for young people that will lead to a career pathway. So initially when we're thinking about what those trainings are gonna be, we were thinking about what supports we might have to put in place. So we were necessarily thinking about the location of the program, right? So for example, a young person might live in Brooklyn and there's an amazing training program in Manhattan. So we thought of what resources that young person might need to get to that location. We're gonna be, we're gonna be providing metro cards to those young people to travel to get to the training programs. We're gonna be provide, providing food because we know that's one of the issues that we have seen in our other programs where young people show up and they tell us they're hungry, they can't focus. Um, so we're gonna make sure whatever resources young people need to get to the program, to get the training that they require so they could get a good job, we're going to make sure those things are in place. Um, but you're not looking at the, um, the area of need or locally um, and funding programs within that, that area? That so community? given the fact it's a model program and mm -hmm. that our focus is quality, impactful programs. So we want to make it easy for young people to travel because we know, um, and our, this has been our experience, that a young person who wants a good job or a, a, a skill will travel. And there was, for many years, we had a program with the Sheet Metal Workers Union right in out in a two-fair zone in Queens. Um, and it was amazing. It was the best attended program we ever funded because young people would travel from around the city because it meant that this it led to a job. job. So. In all the focus groups we did with young people, we learned that they will travel if they if you give them a metro card, if you give them money, I mean, uh, food. food, and so we want to make sure that with the f limited amount of money in this new model, we fund the best 
possible program. If it's in Manhattan, if it's in Brooklyn, if it's in Queens, we want quality because if, it, if, if this program works, and it's the first of its kind in the nation. So I, you know, and it took two years to, to get to this point with a lot of feedback from the, our agency, uh, nonprofit partners. If, we, if it works and it's proven and evaluated over time, we want to scale it up. We want to make sure it works. And so that's why our focus is on quality providers and the supports to help young people access these services. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was a technical issue within the budget and the budget function analysis as related to new budget codes for advance and earn. Will this change be reconciled in the adopted budget? Um, so Michelle and I spoke. Um, it's the way that um, OMB categorized it. So as you guys know, you guys look at budget functions um, and in the budget function under literacy, um, it could appear that literacy funding um, was held whole. Um, but I explained to Michelle that it is um, advanced and earned was categorized in that um, budget function. Um, we can certainly work with OMB to change it into a different function if um, wanted, but um, I think we clarified what that increase that you saw was. We, we will have a follow-up question about that sure. offline, okay? Thank you. Um, and I know, well, my colleague, oh, I know my colleague, especially Margaret Chen, has a question. Um, so I, I will now um, step back because I know she has somewhere to go. Um, and I will continue with my compass question and runaway and homeless youth. Uh, Council Member Chen, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, and especially for um, acknowledging um, Councilmember Fiddler, because I think Councilmember Rose and I, we served with him uh, when we started in the City Council. And I know that the budget for DYCD has grown in the last 10 years, and especially uh, in every area of services. You know, we see the growth of Compass, SYEP, um, but we still got a way to go. And I think that um, it's great that we see uh, the number of beds for homeless and runaway youth. And I think in your uh, testimony, you talk about the mayor's commitment, uh, adding 500 new beds. That's great. We need a new commitment because whatever the number is right now, it's not enough to serve the needs out there. And we're glad that you increase, uh, put in you know, the budget for the beds for young people, homeless youth that are over, um, you know, 21. And, and that's the beginning. So we want to continue to work with you um, to increase that because we just cannot say, oh, we need to go and that's it because the need is so great out there. Um, I just wanted to go back to the Compass, the summer program and the after school program, especially after school program. Um, I know the mayor's, you know, investing uh, in pre-K and K-3. A lot of those kids need the after-school program, too. And I don't know why that DYCD don't have the data in terms of the needs out there. First of all, if you ask the providers, they're waiting lists. They're waiting lists for after-school program. I mean, if you work with them, at least that's a number to start with. And then working with DOE. I mean, maybe this is also a program that DOE needs to take responsibility of. They need to help provide after school program in every single school. Because the, the children, our children need that additional time in terms of learning. And also parents, especially parents that work, immigrant parents um, that are not proficient in English needs help for their kids. So that's a goal that in the council, especially the Women's Caucus, we're pushing for universal after-school program because we see the needs out there. So I think going forward, just like the way we did with summer youth jobs, that we're pushing for a goal and every year we try to 
push for more. And same thing, I think, with the, the summer, um, I mean, the summer program and also with the after school program, we need to continue to grow those programs. Yes, quality is important, but we can have both. We can have quality and quantity because we need that for all our kids to be successful. So I just want to really work with UICD and let's, you know, look at the budget needs that we have and work towards universal after school programs. So we appreciate the support and the partnership. Um, I think, you know, when we designed the initial after school program 14 years ago, unfortunately I was around uh, 14 years ago, uh, the data system didn't allow us to track waiting lists. Um, this new data system, Discover DYCD, will allow us to track waiting lists, not only in after school programs, but eventually over all 46 programs that we support throughout the city. So I think data is important to make a decision on what the need is, and so uh, we look forward to uh, working with you to better identify the needs. And uh, again, each budget year is different. We don't know what the fiscal situation will look next year, whether it's better or worse, uh, that's to be determined. But I, you know, as I said, in the perfect world, if funding wasn't uh, an issue, obviously we'd want to expand services, but obviously in this environment where we've had to make cuts, it was a difficult uh, decision to be able to, 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 to come to, uh, but we want to continue that conversation with you and that partnership with you. Well, when we met in the first hearing, right, Chair Drum, with OMB, there's extra revenue coming in. Their projection is much lower than the council's projection, but there are more revenues coming in. So we do see putting those money into critical programs for our kids. And I hope that we'll be working together to make sure we fight for that money. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember King. Good morning. Thank you both, Chairs, Drum and Rose, and thank you, Commissioner, and your team. Uh, I know you've done a wonderful job, or uh, strive to do a wonderful job, and being our commissioner with all the different agencies that fund money through you to help service children in New York and all New Yorkers. My question to you is pretty much an opening question for you to plug it in any way you like. Um, as someone who's a youth developer, spends time on the ground, helping young people. One of the things that we always do, we pat our children on the back for the wonderful things that they do. But in order to help them improve and grow, we got to tap into the challenges of their everyday existence, whatever that might be. So while we have these reports that you've been able to accomplish so much for after school programs, some of you've jobs, I like to know in your mind and your world, if what would be the biggest challenge that you're having right now with the cuts that you have to administer, as well as continue to deliver for our children. That was my only question to open it up and figure out how we in the council can take your conversation to prove and help you manage before adoption. Well, uh, you know, fortunately, I think, uh, thanks to the creativity of Jadine and her staff, uh, the cuts have really not impacted our core, existing core services, so I don't see any major challenges. Uh, uh, we're fortunate in the respect that we're able to take most of our reductions in non-program expenses, so, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, if new funds became available, we'd always uh, be able to adapt to whatever the need might be, whether it's, you know, some of the things that end up in the adopted budget. Um, but at this point, you know, we're focused on quality. Um, uh, we know that in order to grow any program, we have to show it works. I mean, that to go back to the Advance and Earn uh, program, after a three-year evaluation of our Intern and Earn program, or young adult internship program, we came to the conclusion that even though we felt it worked, after three years of data, it showed it really didn't move the needle on the dial as far as earnings for young people who went through the program. So we're, we strive for scale, but we always strive for quality, because for us to get to scale, we always have to make the case the programs make a difference. And so we're always learning, and so as we learn, and if more money comes available, we're trying to apply it to the best possible programming, because the young people deserve the best possible programming. Uh, thank you for that, and I just want to follow up. Um, as you assess programs that work and don't work, I appreciate you saying, okay, we're going to move this money, shift it over in that program. What happens to the students as we talk about uh, some of youth program um, employment? 
Um, 75,000 jobs we're looking to maintain. We know there's more than 75,000 children in the city of New York. So is there a plan or what is the goal to engage those who may not meet the qualifications of a summer youth program or engaged in any type of training program that you have? So uh, Andre, you want to? Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, I think it's important to understand, although we do serve 75,000 young people, not every young person actually gets selected from the lottery takes a job offer, right? So to fill 75,000 jobs, last year we made over 120,000 offers. Um, what we do, we talk to our providers to encourage young people to look for other opportunities, volunteering opportunities outside of summer youth employment program. Um, at DYCD, we have a very active so social media unit and they provide volunteer opportunities, other job opportunities that young people could tap into. We encourage our providers to also provide um, any additional trainings that young people might have an interest in that falls outside of SYP. For example, we offer other workforce programs within our unit within our division, and we make sure that our providers are aware of those, those different programs that they could talk to young people about. Thank you for your commitment and your effort. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilmember uh, Rosenthal, and uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember uh, Joe Nye. Thank you so much, Chairs, and thank you, Commissioner, for all your hard work. I want to ask about the Advance and Earn program. Um, how many youth are currently served? Is it 900? So it's a brand new program. We're, we just released the RFP. We expect to serve 900 young people, yes. And is that what you had always, I, I had thought the number was much larger than 900. Um, yes, it's less. Um, we're actually combining two programs. Um, the Young Adult Literacy Program that currently young, serves sorry. Young Adult Literacy Program that serves currently 520 young people, and the Intern and Earn Program that serves roughly 1,600 young people on an annual basis. So yes, there's a reduction. So 1,600 and 500 would be 2,100, and you're knocking it down to 900. Correct. Was that listed in the in the PEG program as a reduction? Well, no, actually, in the concept paper, which was released, I think, in the spring, it was made clear that because of the feedback from the nonprofit community who wanted a more robust and a higher reimbursement rate, uh, we knew that there would be fewer young people served, but better programs. Right. And that was part of a two-year process um, of uh, focus groups with young people that Jobs First help organize and uh, other focus groups with providers and in the concept paper that we had to make a choice with finite amount of money. Do we do a better program that serves fewer young people or do we do a program that, uh, as I said, the Young Adolescent, uh, young Adult Internship Program was, the res uh, was evaluated over a three-year period and it basically showed it didn't work in the long run. So, I mean, I, here's, so it I wasn't a cut, it was a thinking. choice of, of, of better programs for, uh, with fewer young people. A thousand percent agree you want the better program. I think that reflects a misunderstanding of OMB and the mayor. More importantly, the mayor committed to good programs, right? In making that statement and calling in aging for model budgeting, by definition it costs more. And I think it's disingenuous to say, we wanted a better program. So therefore, we're serving fewer people. That, that can't be said in a sentence. You want the better program. This is the whole fight about the human service contracts. We want excellent programs. But if that means that we're serving far less people, there's a serious disconnect in the messaging. So I, I just, Chair, want to want to make it clear that this is um, really outrageous that, that we could land here. I'm, I'm very disappointed with OMB, and I'm very disappointed with the mayor. So I understand your point, and let me just say for the record that has our budget has more than doubled, uh, every single program has a higher reimbursement rate than five years ago. Good. And we're still serving more people than five years ago. Good. So the advance and earn is sort of a 
unique situation because it's a program that we, is not in our baseline budget. It comes into our budget for the last 12 years in the executive budget, formerly from the Center for Economic Opportunity, now the Office of Economic Opportunity. And so there, uh, I can't really speak to why we're not fully funded here. Uh, we'll pass on the request to the Office of Economic Opportunity and they can get back to you about um, why the combined funding isn't reflected in the advance and earn uh, RFP. Again, that's really not giving mumbo jumbo about how the process works and o you even using the word OMB or baseline budget doesn't satisfy the need of New Yorkers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we're going to um, uh, Council uh, Chair uh, Chair Rose. Um, well, I'm going to be really brief because. Uh, We've extended our time. Um, but I, I just wanted to circle back to Councilmember Chin's um, remarks uh, about, um, about the data for Compass. Uh, clearly, we don't need to wait for, you know, the portal or the application to, um, to be functional to, to discern what the need is. The need is very clear. The providers can tell us that. So. Um, you know, in the absence of having this mechanism to collect the data, how, how did you arrive at um, the data for Universal Sonic? How was that collected and determined? So I, I don't think we've uh, given, at the preliminary budget hearing, we just gave a back of the envelope analysis of what it would take to have a program in every elementary school that didn't have a program. So that really is back of the envelope. Uh, that doesn't even, universal to me implies every young person who wants an after school program uh, uh, gets an after school seat. That's a very, uh, that's something we really need real data on. So it was really back of the envelope. We looked at how many programs uh, we have in schools that serve elementary students and how many don't. And then we just did a, a literally back of the envelope. Um, if anything else to add? Um, there's nothing else to add. Um, as we indicated um, in the prior hearing, um, we're working um, with OMB. There's always conversations. I think this is a larger conversation than us. Our role um, is to implement whatever um, priorities the mayor OMB has. Um, so um, we continue to have conversations. So do you still expect to release a, con a Compass concept paper? And what's the timeline? And what's the goal for the release of this concept paper? Uh, there's no plan uh, in the immediate future. As you know, uh, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services is convening a series of focus groups to get feedback. And so once we have the results of those focus groups, we can then start the process for a concept paper. But there's nothing planned in the immediate future. So is there a, a timeline for the focus groups and You'd how long speak, you're going to you do have to speak, that? You have to speak to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services since they're leading those focus groups. So um, the council, uh, we still expect to be a part of this conversation when it occurs um, and we are anticipating our invitation um, because we did ask in the fall of 2018 to be a part of that process. We'll pass on the request to them. Okay. Um, I, I want to em enforce the fact that we're very serious about being a part of that conversation. Thank you. Um, and I, I'd just like to know how many individual touches did DYCD make with um, runaway and homeless youth individuals in fiscal year 2019? Um, uh, and you receive the information from providers daily, right, uh, on runaway and homeless youth? We have a data system that tells us um, how many young people are in our runaway and homeless youth beds on a daily basis, yes. Okay. So then this information should be available um, to pass on to my committee staff um, uh, because when they want to brief me on these statistics, uh, oftentimes, these numbers are not available. So if you get them on a daily basis, we should be able to get them uh, 
I believe the report the reported in the legislation that's required is it uh, every six months. So, and you know, so anything is a snapshot. But I think in the most recent reports will show that there's always vacant beds on any given night. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, it, uh, we're we're working on trying to do better education of all our network of providers so they know how to locate a bed. So if a young person shows up at one program and that program is fully occupied, there's always beds available that are appropriate for that young person mm -hmm. somewhere else in the network of programs. And the number of vacancies will, uh, the, our capacity will grow even more as we add the remaining 98 beds. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're, we're in a situation where on any given night, any young person will be turned away uh, under the age of 20 and 21. Well, how, how would we be able to resolve the conflicts in the PMMR? I, um, I, your quest, the council questions were shared, and I think there, we really need to dig into that, and I think we're, I'm happy to do that. I, th we, I think, I believe I understand your mm -hmm. questions, and I think there is some miscommunication there that we would be happy to walk through. It's, it's pretty detailed for this conversation here, but I do want to add that responding simply to the question of how many no young people have been served in a crisis or till program to date wouldn't be difficult to, for us to get to you. So if that's the question, we can get you that information pretty Okay, and, we're, and we will have an offline uh, conversation about the, this process. Um, and so um, do you have your new youth uh, tally uh, that was taken in the youth count that was taken in January? Yes. Okay. Bear with me one second. Um, I'm, this is actually posted publicly on the CIDI website, mm -hmm. the um, New York City Youth Count 2018 numbers, and there's a nice infographic. Yeah, this is there. 2018, so she asked about the one in 2019. 2019. Oh, that, oh. 2019. Yeah. Um, have you? We haven't done that. Um, yet? I can get back to you on 2019. We should yeah. be able to have pr preliminary numbers for you, yeah. though it's not like beautified yeah. into a report. We can give you some pr the preliminary yeah. numbers. Okay. CIDI does the numbers crunching, uh, and so. There's nothing officially reported, but we can give you a preliminary readout from, from 2019. Yeah. Okay. Could you just make sure that we get those numbers? Yes. Uh, when you have them? Okay. Thank you. Um, Chair Drum, um, uh, I am, uh, that, that concludes my questions for today. Okay. Okay. Very good. So we're going to uh, say thank you to this panel, and we have another panel, Small Business Services, coming in. And we'll take a five-minute break and then reconvene for that uh, committee. Thank you Thank very you. much, Commissioner.
Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Small Business, chaired by Councilmember Mark Jonai. I don't believe we have any co other colleagues with us right now, but maybe some will come. We just heard from the Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development, and we will hear from Greg Bishop, the Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I'll open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Joe Nye. Thank you, Chair Drum. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's budget hearing. My name is Mark Jonah, and I am the Chair of the Council's Committee on Small Business. Today we will be hearing from the Department of Small Business Services on their fiscal 2020 executive budget that totals $189 million. New funding has been added to the executive budget for programs related to Career Pathways and NYC at Work Initiative. Conversely, funding has been reduced for initiatives such as the School Bus Grant Program and the Green Jobs Program. It is the Council's responsibility to ensure that the City's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to New Yorkers. Hence, as the Chair of Small Business Services, I will continue to push for accountability and accuracy and ensure that the budget reflects the needs and the interests of the city. In the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response, the Council urged the administration to temper the expansion of personal services, PS spending, through hiring freezes and vacancy reductions in recent fiscal years, including 70 vacant positions of the Department of Small Business Services, among others. In the fiscal 2019, the agency's actual headcount every month has been overstated, creating a slush fund of over 100 positions and has been consistently below planned headcounts for the past, for the last several years. I am happy to see that the executive budget that the agency reduced the planned headcount from 360 to 283, a total of 77 positions that shouldn't have been on the books to begin with. Currently, the planned headcount of 283 positions is 19 more than the actual headcount of 264. I'd like to see this applied to all agencies. And I don't want to take the credit for this, Commissioner, but it's the consistent reminders that of the headcount difference that has um, made this adjustment. And I'm looking forward to applying the same to every agency so we can actually be as transparent and open to New Yorkers on how we spend their money rather than create slush funds. The budget shouldn't be a three-card Monty. Um, I think New Yorkers deserve better. It is essential that the budget we adopt this year is transparent, accountable, and reflective of the priorities and the interests of the Council and the people we represent. This hearing is a vital part of the process, and I expect that SBS will be responsive to the questions and concerns of the Council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the Administration over the next few months to ensure that the fiscal 2020 adopted budget meets the goals that the Council has set out. I'd like to thank Commissioner Bishop and I say this behind closed doors and in the open, you really are a good partner. And I know your heart's in the right place, your head is certainly there, and I think we can do a lot more uh, with less restraints. You truly have a passion and a commitment to making sm small businesses survive, creating an environment for them to thrive, understanding, and you have your finger on the pulse. I just wished this administration would give you the leeway and control of the reins that you so rightly deserve and can do such a great job at. With that in mind, I want to thank you um, for today and for testifying, and I'd like to thank your staff, which is wonderful at times, <laughs> who have consistently been responsive to our many requests. Um, I'd like to be able to analyze the city's budget without your cooperation. This wouldn't be possible. So thank you, and I'd like to thank both my staff and the staff of the Finance Division for the help in preparing for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to ask Council to swear the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony today will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. I do. Thank okay. you. Please begin. 
All right, uh, so thank you very much for those kind words, uh, Council Member Jonai, and, and certainly I know we share uh, equal passion for our small businesses and, um, and, and the fact that we are both immigrants and we have created an opportunity here um, is a testament not only to uh, the great city of New York, uh, but the great country of America, and uh, I thank you for, uh, as, as sometimes as, as challenging as it could be, uh, your, your passion uh, towards making this city a great place for our small businesses. Uh, good morning, Chairs Drum and, and Jonai and, and members of the Committees on Finance and Small Business. My name is Greg Bishop and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I'm joined by SBS First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon and my senior leadership team. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today I will share updates on our efforts to achieve this aim since my last testimony. And after my testimony, I'm happy to take your questions. First, I'd like to give you an overview of our agency budget. Uh, from there, I will discuss the services made possible through this funding. SBS's fiscal year 2020 executive budget is $189 million with a headcount of 327 employees. The executive budget includes pass-through funding that is not spent or managed by SBS but is used as a conduit funding for other city entities. Of the 189 million, 38% or 72 million is passed through funding, which includes 35 million for the New York City Economic Development Corporation, 20.7 million for NYC and Company, 14.9 million for Governors Island, and 1.4 million for the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. The remaining 116.9 million or 62% of the fiscal year 2020 executive budget is allocated for SBS's programs. This funding supports SBS's mission of economically empowering New Yorkers through our workforce, business, and neighborhood services. And now I'll talk a lot about our support for businesses because they are essential to the local economy and character of our neighborhoods. They provide opportunities uh, for individuals to strength strengthen their own economic security and provide jobs for members of their communities. SBS operates a network of seven NYC Business Solutions Centers that provide free, high-quality services to help small businesses not only start, but operate and grow in New York City. These centers are at the core of our business support strategy and offer services including access to capital, which we know many small businesses need, uh, MWB certification, navigating government regulations, and workforce recruitment. In fiscal year 2018, SBS NYC Business Solutions Center served almost 10,000 unique businesses, and our capital access services have connected small businesses to over $50 million in financing. We connect business owners to financing through capacity building courses, matching business owners with the right lender for their needs and business profile, assisting them with packaging their applications, and creating projections in order to present their information to lenders in the best light. To assist industrial and manufacturing businesses, SBS contracts with nine industrial business service providers, and in fiscal year 2018, the IBSP has connected more than 400 unique businesses to nearly 800 services. This spring, uh, we announced the launch of a new culturally competent business education courses tailored to the needs of immigrant entrepreneurs. These new business education opportunities offer multiple sessions, including a five-course Introduction to Entrepreneurship series and a six-course Digital Marketing series, because as you know, technology is very important uh, for our small businesses to adapt. The new business courses will be available to entrepreneurs in multiple languages, including Spanish, Mandarin, and Russian. Along with improving our in-person course off offerings, earlier this month we also announced the first online business course series offered by the city for entrepreneurs across the five boroughs. Through this new initiative, entrepreneurs can now apply to be connected to upcoming courses on topics including business operations, development, human resources, financing, marketing, and management. Those are areas we know that small businesses, especially if you don't have a strong back office, uh, struggle with, so we wanted to make sure we provided the resources for them. We are confident that these new online offerings and culturally competent business education courses will help more New Yorkers build and grow their small businesses at their convenience. To date, SBS business education programs have already served more than 59,000 entrepreneurs, and we look forward to working with council to reach more New Yorkers. SBS also continues to develop targeted programs to meet the most pressing challenges faced by New York City's business owners. Our commercial lease assistance program provides eligible business with legal services on topics including lease negotiations, formalizing oral lease agreements, and landlord harassment. Of the more than, 
of, of the more business owners served through the programs, 80% are minority owned, 60% are immigrant owned, and nearly half are owned by women. SBS also plays a key role in the city's minority and women business enterprise program. The MWBE program aims to support the growth of minority and women owned businesses through city procurement, ensuring that our vendors reflect the diversity of our city. SBS certifies MWBEs. Uh, we also provide essential capacity billing services, and we also provide uh, technical assistance to help MWBEs not only compete for, but also execute on city contracts. Uh, to date, we have certified more than 7,400 MWBEs, uh, more than 100% increase since the start of the administration. And this year, we launched a new online application portal to further streamline the certification process. For certified MWBs, we know cash flow is often an issue and while, while working on city projects. So this administration created the Contract Financing Loan Fund. This $10 million revolving fund lets small businesses borrow up to a million dollars, kept at a 3% interest rate. Since the fund launched in 2017, SBS has awarded loans worth more than $9 million, opening the door to more than $52 million in contracts for small businesses. And we are also proud to announce that one of our major annual events for MWBEs, and I invite you to come and uh, take a look, uh, is our 13th annual citywide procurement fair, which will be held on Tuesday, June 11th at Columbia University. The procurement fair provides an invaluable opportunity for our certified firms to connect with not only city agencies, but also federal and state, public authorities, private corporations, and prime contractors to explore contracting opportunities and other opportunities for growth. SBS provides support for New Yorkers to gain new skills and connect to living wage jobs. We focus on grown sectors on, in our economy and prepare New Yorkers to seize those opportunities. SBS assists job seekers with a wide range of skill levels through an inclusive growth strategy that ensures community members, employers, and education institutions are all aligned to increase the number of local residents uh, prepared for and getting good jobs. Through our network of 18 Workforce One Career Centers, SBS connects job seekers with employment opportunities, industry-informed trainings, and a variety of candidate development services such as resume writing, resume development, interview preparation, and job search workshops. Annually, we connect more than 25,000 New Yorkers to employment and nearly 4,000 New Yorkers with the training needed to advance their careers. And through our industry partnership, SBS works collaboratively with industry to invest in local talent in the food service, industrial construction, healthcare, and tech sectors. Examples of industry partnership initiatives that are supported by our budget include job quality programs in, health, in home health care and efforts to bring skilled tech talent from private industry to teach at local CUNY colleges. For example, Tech Talent Pipeline, the city's tech industry partnership, recently developed a new program to prepare New Yorkers with limited tech experience for in-demand data analysis, data analysis career. The program called the, the Data Analyst, I'm sorry, I said analysis, the Data Analyst Training Accelerator aims to provide an accessible pathway to data analyst careers for New Yorkers who are underrepresented in the tech economy, including those who are seeking an alternative to a four-year degree. New York City's growing tech ecosystem is made up of more than 320,000 jobs across the five boroughs, and SBS is working to ensure all New Yorkers can participate in this important sector of our economy. Using the industry knowledge gained from our employers, SBS works with provider partners, including tech boot camps and community-based organizations to create industry-informed trainings across multiple career pathways. In the healthcare sector, we support trainings for workers in home health care, medical assisting, and nursing, providing a variety of entry points and advancement opportunities for New Yorkers with different levels of experience. We work closely with local community groups to recruit for all 28 trainings SBS offers across the many sectors we focus on to ensure residents are, easy, are able to easily access, access these opportunities. In alignment and support of the administration's visions of equity of opportunity, we have developed bridge programs and tailored employment services. For example, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and community-based organizations, we created unique employment and training services tailored to the strength and needs of immigrant New Yorkers. These programs include bilingual medical assistant training, bridge to tech, and preparation for nursing for foreign trained nurses. We have also worked with youth education partners, including the Department of Education's Career and Technical Education and District 79 to create a suite of employment and training services to support young adults. 
These efforts include co-location of a West Farm Workforce One Career Center in the Bronx that, that allows young adults to combine work and school and access programs and access bridge programs in transportation, healthcare, and tech. Now I'll talk a little bit about our support for commercial corridors. The expertise of local underground partners is essential to addressing the unique challenges faced by New York City's diverse neighborhoods and businesses. SBS oversees the largest network of business improvement districts in the country with 76 bids delivering more than $159 million in services to 93,000 businesses throughout the five boroughs. The vital work of the city's 76 bids is highlighted in our recently published fiscal year 2018 bid trends report. SBS provides the bid network and other community development organizations with technical assistance, grant opportunities, and capacity building services, further strengthening the direct connection between our agency and our local small businesses. For example, our Neighborhood 360 Fellows Program pairs 10 paid full-time neighborhood development specialists with 10 community-based organizations. The program not only provides local organizations with dedicated support for commercial revitalization projects, but also builds a pipeline of diverse talent in the neighborhood development field. SBS also works with community partners to identify the needs of local commercial district and plan targeted solutions through our commercial district needs assessments, or CDNAs. CDNAs identify the strengths and challenges and opportunities within a commercial corridor to better inform subsequent investments. To date, we have worked with community partners to establish 10 CDNAs, and in 2018, SBS shifted the focus of our N Avenue NYC grant program for project-based awards to long-term commitments. Avenue NYC enables awardees to hire a full-time program manager, conduct a CDNA, and implement programming based on findings. Nine additional CDNAs are now being completed through the Avenue NYC grants awarded in 2018. And in April 2019, uh, SBS announced four additional multi-year grant awards to help empower commu community-based organizations to strengthen and preserve their commercial corridors. Our agency is dedicated to ensuring that job seekers, entrepreneurs, and business owners and community organizations can connect with our range of free services and together create a vibrant, diverse New York. And of course, through the support of council, our Chamber on the Go initiative allows us to send trained business specialists to canvas commercial corridors and connect with business owners. Since launching in December 2015, Chamber on the Go has reached more than 13,000 businesses directly at their doorsteps. SBS also has an additional outreach tool, the mobile outreach unit, equipped with classroom space and computers. SBS staff use the mobile outreach unit to provide on-site referrals to our free business services, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with MW certification applications, resources during an emergency, and recruitment events to connect job seekers with employment opportunities. I, of course, continue to look forward to the continu continued partnership of the council in building a more vibrant and inclusive economy as we expand the reach of SBS programs to more New Yorkers. Thank you very much uh, for your support, and I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, let me start off with uh, just some questions around the School Buzz Grant Program. Um, and a matter of fact, I don't, didn't see that addressed in the first slide that you uh, put up. Can we put that <coughs> first slide up again? Um, the fiscal 2020 executive plan does not include funding in SBS's budget for the school bus grant program, which was implemented after employee protection provisions or EPPs were removed from the pupil transportation contracts. Is this because the DOE released a request for bids for pupil transportation services beginning in the uh, 2019 to 20 uh, school year that includes EPPs? So as, um, I don't think that they're, they're related. As you know, um, the program as it is right now is currently budgeted for $2 million, which will enable our service and the reimbursement to continue to August, which is the completion of the school year. It is our hope um, that either through the state legislature, um, there will be an agreement on the uh, EPP, um, resulting in the fix to um, the, the contracting challenges that DOE experienced. So if there's not, because there's, it's been a problem in the past to get legislation um, passed in Albany on this particular topic, what plan do you have to follow up? So we will, so because we're the conduit, uh, we will work closely with not only OL, Office of Labor Relations and DOE uh, to ensure that there will be uh, continued support uh, for uh, trained drivers. I mean, that, that we, we are just the, the conduit to reimburse, um, um, you know, the, the, the employee protections that the companies are paying. 
Um, so we will continue to work closely with the administration in terms of building, um, in, in terms of figuring out what the, the a plan B would be. Uh, but it is our hope, uh, based on the change in, in, on the state level, that we will see um, this resolved okay, and before also, the end of August. Yeah, so also the, uh, the DOE included EPPs and the People Transportation RFP issued in December 17, but the DOE was prevented from opening those bids by a lawsuit which challenged the legality of these employee protections. Uh, if DOE is prevented from funding the EPPs in the new contract, will SBS continue to fund the bus grant programs? And, and did you say, when did you say, that is the decision that you're going to make based on the state legislation or the lawsuit, or both? <laughs> I think it's going to be both. I mean, so the, the high level is that we will always be focused on ensuring um, that our school kids are, are transported by experienced drivers. Um, and as you have seen in the past, the administration is very much focused on that. Um, based on where we are at right now in this budget cycle, um, we do have enough money to uh, fund the program through the end of this school year, and as I hope there will be a resolution. If there isn't a resolution, we will still remain committed um, in, in, in terms of making sure that the, 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 the program continues. And if, if not, we'd see that in the November plan, I guess? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, the fiscal 2020 executive plan includes a decrease of 17 staff members for the construction safety training initiative. Was the reason for the decrease in headcount? What is the reason for the decrease in headcount, and what is the remaining headcount for the initiative now? So, in terms of the, the decrease, um, you know, when we first went to the drawing board in terms of actually designing the program, um, we because it's the first time we ever had to figure out how to rapidly train over 60,000 individuals. Um, we were aggressive in terms of the, the type of resources that we needed. As we are now uh, building out the program, working with local org uh, organizations and using technology, uh, we've been able to actually save on the personnel side, um, but m do more focus on the technology side and depending on our, our local partners. Uh, so we uh, uh, realized the savings of 17, and the remaining number is now 13. Um, so um, how did you select the training providers? Uh, through an RFP process um, and all, and yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, Commissioner, okay. Go. Technically we are the training provider and what we're, we selected were, were partners to help us administer the training um, and that was through an RFP process. So I've, I've heard some complaints from the Asian communities about a Asian language um, services being provided. Have you heard that? And if so, uh, how are you working to um, change that? Yeah, we, we have, and we've met with uh, those partners. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that we are working, because we're doing the, the training um, using technology, um, you know, figuring out ways we can address language access. Um, and, of course, one of the other things that we're looking at is using those organizations to ensure that we have penetration in um, immigrant communities. Uh, so that way they know that they have, using our system of um, Workforce One centers, uh, that they can actually uh, get trained in the language um, that they're comfortable with. Particularly with the Asian community? Correct. Okay, great. Um, what, what is the, the budget um, for this uh, program at this point? It's roughly $62 million over multiple years. Okay. But a bulk of that, those dollars is actually, uh, because the program is built for small businesses to reimburse their employees uh, once they're trained. So a bulk of those dollars is uh, for the reimbursement. Okay, thank you. And what is the role of SBS in implementing the Construction Safety Training Initiative? So per the law, um, we are required to uh, make the training um, available to people who don't have access. And so we are responsible for delivering the training to essentially th um, three groups of people. Those who are uh, um, new entrants to construction, essentially. We wouldn't want the, the requirement to keep them out. Um, day laborers um, and the employees of small businesses. So those are the three aspects of our, of our training. Do you monitor the program or do you um, um, do any site visits or audits? We will. It's all in development. Okay. So when will that be done, do you know? Um, in the, the, it'll be, 
implemented in stages. So the grant program for small businesses, that the way that works is they go and get their training wherever they can and wherever it's reasonable and, and makes sense for them, we reimburse them. That should be launched early June-ish. Okay. Um, we are building the online curriculum, as the commissioner said, and we're gonna deploy that through our Workforce One Career Centers, which should happen later in the summer-ish. Um, and, that, and that same timing, the day laborers will, organizations will be uh, administering that, that program through their sites, although they are already doing uh, one component of the training in person as we speak, so. So then they'd feed numbers back to you, is that the, how it would work? Say, I'm sorry, one more They would thing. feed numbers back to you, attendees, registrants for oh, the Oh yeah, this, it's all, they can access, um, we have an electronic um, system that, to support the exchange of data. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, bridge programs. Bridge programs are the on-ramp for lower skilled job seekers, providing access to education and training programs in a continuum that leads to quality jobs with family supporting wages. The administration's Career Pathways report recommended that the city spend $60 million annually by 2020 on bridge programs. How much has SPS spent on this program each year since it was implemented? So I can, I can start off by saying, um, you know, we know that bridge program is important, and of course, you know, we're focused on investing in and building out our industry partnerships um, per the recommendation of Career Pathways. Uh, so far, um, you know, we have, we have offered bridge programming in healthcare tech and commercial driving um, with a total uh, since FY17. Uh, we've done about half a million um, in FY17, half a million in FY18. Um, and a li little bit about uh, over uh, 700,000 in FY19. Uh, I think there's a larger conversation that's happening uh, citywide, uh, led by the Office of Workforce Development in terms of uh, the administration's um, uh, funding of uh, bridge program. Um, but we understand uh, how important it is and we look forward to working with the Office of Workforce Development uh, to figure out how we can actually address uh, the larger conversation. Is the Office of Workforce Development the the, the, the um, agency that's responsible for um, oversight of the program? So uh, yes, the Office of Workforce Development is responsible for uh, all the workforce initiatives across multiple agencies. Uh, okay. So for example, uh, we focus on adult, uh, Department of Education uh, folks focus on adult literacy, uh, DYCD focuses on young, uh, on youth. Uh, so the Office of Workforce Development is the agency, well, the office that coordinates all, the mayor's office that coordinates all, all of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the budget response, the council called upon the administration to provide a comprehensive budget and operations report on all city funded bridge programmings with each financial plan. Would you agree to provide that information to us? Sure, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about the Plaza program and then I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair. Uh, we've recently heard that a number of um, business improvement districts that have pedestrian plazas within their boundaries that they are at an impasse with the administration with respect to renegotiating their expired plaza contracts. Under those contracts, the bids maintain and provide programming for the plazas. While I understand that the plaza program falls under DOT's jurisdiction, I have a few questions for S SBS because your agency manages the bids. Uh, what is the status of the negotiations between the bids and the city with respect to these agreements? Um, so I guess the question I have is, what is the your definition of recently because as of about three or three weeks ago um, I met with and had a conversation with the negotiating team that represents all the bids um, and the city and they were in a good place um, a lot of their questions and concerns were addressed uh, not only by DOT but by city law and they were actually uh, pleasantly surprised and they were reviewing the final language um, so if recently, meaning you heard last week that they were at impasse, then that's not what I... The case any longer. Right. Okay, yeah. so the complaints basically were based on those who felt that um, the uh, expenses for programming was going to be passed on to the bids and that it was a way to uh, do a, a, an assessment, an increase in, in uh, what the bids had to pay uh, and they had to pick up the cost of that. Um, so that is new to me in terms of the expenses for the programming. The issue that um, was the sticking point was about liability. 
Okay, about uh, li and, liability. And, and gross and liability okay. and what that means and who would be responsible for uh, in terms of, you know, our plaza programs are, are a terrific addition to the city's landscape. Um, uh, but we know that New York City tends to be a very litig litigious city. Um, so that is part of the challenge uh, where if someone trips over a cobblestone, mm -hmm. who actually will be responsible for defending that suit? Um, and you know the city and DOT is very committed to ensuring uh, that we continue their great relationship because our plazas, we do not want to make uh, all the investments that we've been making, the capital investments, just to see our plazas deteriorate um, in terms of quality of life concerns. Um, so uh, both parties are, are very much at the table and as recently as I, as, as I said three weeks ago, uh, the city uh, sort of, um, and the, the law department and DOT um, worked with um, the, the bid association to s address some of the concerns. So are these the more large uh, um, the, um, plazas or no. plazas connected to corporations or? No, know? no, no. So, I mean, and that was one of the, the challenges. Um, as we know, so for example, I mean, the, the biggest plaza everyone knows is Times Square. Um, and Times Square Alliance has the capacity and resources, although they may want to use those resources for other things to handle lawsuits. Uh, however, uh, we have plazas all across the five boroughs in smaller neighborhoods uh, where there may be not even just a bid, but a, a local organization um, that just has a staff of one or two. Uh, to get a lawsuit um, it, you know, for that organization, that will basically shut down the organization because they would have to spend most of their time just working on a lawsuit. So that was a concern. It was about equity in terms of how can we help the smaller, not only bids, uh, because I think there's a misnomer in terms of all the bids are, have the budget of like Times Square and Downtown Alliance. They don't. The average bid size in terms of budget is about two, 300,000 across the city. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we were equitably uh, treating the smaller bids and also smaller organizations. Um, and that was sort of where the, the, the conversation uh, revolved around. And I think we got to a point where we are now on, all on the same page. Okay, good, because I also have one that has no partner, uh, and I'm just wondering how that's going to affect it, but I'll, I'll check in with DOT sure. on that. And I'd be happy to follow up with you as well. Um, sure, if, it's if the Diversity recent, Plaza. Yeah. It, what is it, University Diversity Plaza? Pla Diversity, Diversity Plaza. Diversity Plaza, Plaza. Yeah. got it. All right, thank you, Commissioner, I appreciate it. Okay, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Moyer, and, and excuse me, and Councilmember Miller. And now I'm gonna turn to Chair uh, Joan I for questions. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, I want to piggyback on the question that the Chair uh, just brought up in around these plazas. The, le the insurance requirement that was being placed on bids. So I guess the first question is, is SBS's role when it comes to bids one that manages, controls, or guides? So all Business improvement districts are independent 501c3. Mm -hmm. uh, the management is, uh, the, the structure of the bid, the management is left to the board, which SBS is part of. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of control, we are the agency that provides oversight. Uh, so every bid, uh, because they're a 501c3, have to be in compliance with state law uh, for nonprofits. And, and that is our role. Uh, so for example, and I talked about capacity. There are some bids, for example, uh, the state law requires if you're a nonprofit to have annual meetings. Uh, there are some bids that have not had annual meetings. Uh, there's, there's rules related in terms of what your board structure looks like. Uh, there are some bids that have um, you know, um, unfilled positions. So our goal and our focus and part of our work in terms of uh, equity is looking and giving resources to the smaller bids and providing them uh, additional support from our office to make sure that they're in compliance. Then we also have, in terms of oversight, um, because our, the funding that they are receiving is actually passed through, it, it comes through the Department of Finance, we have to make sure that those dollars are spent appropriately. Uh, so based on the district plan, the bids have a, a plan in terms of how they should spend their dollars. The, the assessment is just one 
part of funding. Bids do not have to just depend on, uh, on the assessment. They could actually do their independent fundraising, et cetera. Uh, but that's all based on what the board decides. Uh, I mean, that's a great explanation, Commissioner, and I understand the oversight. But why is it that certain funding that you receive where you're the conduit, you take the role as, I'm sorry, I'm just a conduit. I don't know what they really do with that money and how uh, they spend it. But in this regard, when it's actually a surcharge, that taxpayers, those small businesses, are paying into, we have more control. Why can't we treat them similar to those conduits where it's your dollars, we're just going to make sure, and the compliance end of it, I agree with, but give them better control of how they spend their money, who they hire, what marketing techniques they want to use, and actually defend them by helping them spend their money more wisely, where it'll allow more shoppers to come into their districts to patronize those stores, and not use their budgets for city services, such as sanitation, such as security, such as insurance for plazas, and the maintenance of, in which they don't even have full control of, I believe, when it comes to the plaza and the events that are held, there's a partnership there. So it's a complicated web that we've created. And I do believe SBS is an essential partner, statutorily and a good partner in the marketplace for guidance, for compliance. But we also don't want SBS to become another branch of government that has a hammer on one hand, a pair of scissors in the other, and they say pick and choose. No, and I, and I, and I read it was the bids that I'm involved with, many of them have very small budgets. And we, I think we both agree that we have to expand those budgets where they can properly function for their intended purpose. And a bid under $100,000 is not one that can survive. And depending on the commercial corridors and the needs, we could better work with them. But when SBS has a deciding vote on who the bid director is going to be, it's a little convoluted there. When SBS has a vote on how that money is spent, and correct me if I'm wrong here, correct? SBS oh, has, I will. I'm sorry? I will. I'm sure you will. Uh, SBS has voting rights alongside the board, am I correct? So, so SBS is part of the board, right? including the controller, mm -hmm. including the council member mm -hmm. uh, for that particular area, and then including the class A, uh, um, the building owners. And don't forget the council member. I did, I said the council member. Uh, so SBS is just one voice. Um, and there has been situations uh, where we had uh, underperforming executive directors, um, or we've had hires where SBS, the, our, my representative, we wanted one uh, particular candidate and the rest of the board wanted another. Um, and there have been situations where um, the board sided with SBS and there have been situations where the board said, no, we're gonna go the, with the candidate that we wanted. We Would that fall on the compliance or guidance? It falls on the board fall? governance. Uh, oh, we, governance. We are just, we are part of the board. And the board is the one that ultimately makes the decision on any type of hiring. Right. Um, we, you know, we, what we will do is if there is something that, um, because every bid is, can be audited by the controller. Mm -hmm. uh, so if there's something that is operating, for example, if a board makes a hire without the due process of going through the proper channels of showing that you, you know, interviewed the right candidates, you followed EEO rules, et cetera, Yes, as part of our oversight responsibility, we will say you need to follow this process. Now, if you end up with a candidate that the SBS rep, my, my um, rep, we may not have thought may have been the best candidate, that's fine. It's the board's decision. Our job now is to provide support for that 
particular candidate to be as successful as possible. I'm, I'm with you, but there's also a belief out there that there is too much control by SBS. And that is an incorrect belief. And I think what you're seeing and mm -hmm. what you're hearing is that we have, over the past three years, we have taken a different approach in terms of how we manage our business improvement districts. One of the things that we're doing is looking at the across the board at in, at governance in terms of which of the which of the bids are actually not in compliance with state law, and because they're not in compliance with state law, we are taking a very aggressive approach in terms of ensuring that those bids have the resources. No, Commissioner, I I, yep. I'm all in agreement with compliance. I'm with you. We have certain requirements that they have to Correct. call on them, guidelines. I'm yep. with you, the compliance end of it. I'm talking about outside of the compliance end to make sure that their meetings are being held and are transparent, that yep. they have their annual meetings, that yep. the democracy and the majority votes. And I'm with all of that. And that they comply with city, state, and federal laws. Correct. I'm with you. I'm referring to the fear that if SBS is candidate for a, a, the manager and their suggestions and that they have a say on who they bring, you're actually training some of the district managers, I believe? So any executive director has mm -hmm. to go through a training uh, through SBS in terms of understanding their responsibilities. Prior to the hiring or after the hiring? After they're hired. But don't you also have a program in place now where you're actually training some of these executive directors now and then they're also applying for the positions as they become available? Oh, you, so so there, there's a neighborhood fellows program, oh. um, which I refer to in um, my testimony. And that is one of the th one of the things we saw was that when business improvement districts are looking for leaders, uh, there wasn't a deep bench of individuals who uh, have either like a planning background or understood, um, you know, or saw this as a career path. So we wanted to create a deep bench of potential future leaders. Um, and yes, if someone graduated from our program um, and applied for a, a business um, a executive director position, um, you know, uh, depending on the candidate, if the candidate is the right candidate, SBS will be supportive. I, I don't want to make this strictly about business, just one segment of the whole budget, but I just want to reiterate that we, th there's a belief out there, especially from small business, that do doesn't view government as a true partner and the fear of Big Brother now infiltrating, controlling, demanding, managing, guiding um, is a overstep, right. especially when it comes to the funding source. This is a surcharge that is placed on small business owners, property owners that's passed on to tenants. And they want greater control, greater say, and allow for creativity without the umbrella of, or the pressure of, SBS, which is a branch of government. And we'll continue to, I don't want to make this strictly about this. Our, our intent is to keep people out of jail, uh, uh, Council. I'm with so, you, we should keep them out of jail. So we, if, if, the, if the narrative is different, then I'd be happy to work with you to change that narrative so that way people can understand that we are truly a partner. Then let's be a real partner. Bids have certain issues that they bring to the attention of SBS and their elected officials consistently. And that is, please let me use the limited funding that I have for marketing and improving, making capital improvements, uh, holding events that will draw in bigger crowds so we can have them patronize our businesses. I do not want to use the limited resources that we have for sanitation purposes. Mm -hmm. And that is, I'm not expecting Department of Sanitation to go out there and start sweeping the streets up. It's not what we're asking for. But on garbage pickups, which are an issue, um, on uh, policing, and they have to hire their own security, which is another city services, um, on allowing them to be as creative as possible because fundamentally, there's a real scare. And that scare is that small businesses are going to go by the way of the dinosaur because of the internet. And there's only so many restaurants that you could possibly have, so many nail salons and hair salons that you could have in a commercial corridor. Our local mom and pop shops are threatened 
their future is threatened by big box store competition, by the internet, and consumer behavior changes. I really would love for us to focus on short-term and long-term strategies, especially when it comes to their money, allowing them to use every bit of creativity that they can and spend every penny as wisely as possible. And I know you're gonna say that, yes, cleaner sidewalks make for a better shopping experience, which will make for more consumer. I'm with you. There's just areas that we can work with them, and when they're spending upward of, and some of these bids spend three quarters of their budget, or half their budget, on city services. But let's continue. Do you want me to respond, or? Not really. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> it'll I'd be a great response, I'm sure. <laughs> we won't address the issue. <laughs> Given the opportunity, Commissioner, what are the frustrations that you've had or two significant areas of change that you can make within this budget that we can work on together that you would love, that you would prefer that we start focusing on that perhaps hasn't been getting the attention, whether through this council or whether through the administration when it comes to the needs of small businesses? What is that we can do in this budget? You know, I, you know uh, so I, I would say that we have had a, a good conversation with not only council, but with um, OMB. Um, we are, you know, continuing doing the work that we, uh, and I talked about it in my testimony. Um, council has presented a package of bills uh, that um, at the very, uh, at, I'm very happy to see that there is a focus on addressing uh, a lot of the issues that small businesses face. Um, you know, your support with, with Chamber on the Go, um, again, when I go out to the communities, um, awareness of our services, um, people understanding that, you know, and we have funded as administration, for example, a commercial lease assistance program, but there are, there are still people out there, entrepreneurs who are signing leases and don't know how to connect to our services. Um, so if anything, I would say uh, just continue funding for Chamber on the Go so we can actually have more people out in the in the communities um commissioner 50 yep. percent of the businesses never make it to year five they're not even getting to a lease renewal if you're a restaurant it's as high as 80 percent what is it that we can do well, to I would help those businesses forget it I'm, i when, think it's great for those that need the help many of these small business many not all have yep. attorneys that um, or have been in business for so long that they know how to negotiate a lease and they may not need that service those that obviously do I'm glad that you offer that service what is it to do what is it that we can do to increase this tragedy of a statistic that 50% of small businesses startups never make it to year five what can we do in this budget so I mean that, that that's a very um, uh, th there is there's a lot we could do right um, and sure. we're, do we're, we're, we're doing it right now but I want to tell you, when I talk to small businesses, right, the, the, there's three major concerns. Over, there's actually a lot of concerns, but there's access to capital, right? There's a lot of businesses. And when you talk about the failure rate of businesses, there's so many reasons why businesses fail. It could be a failed business uh, plan. It could be they weren't properly capitalized. Uh, it could be they didn't have the right employees. Uh, there's so many reasons why businesses fail. But I, what I will say is that, you know, access to capital, mm -hmm. um, uh, regulations. Um, so, you know, and you and I have had conversations about regulations, and I, I think, you know, we, and part of the package of bills that we talked about, um, that council, in, that you introduced, and, um, you know, talks about codifying some of the work that we're already doing in terms of uh, regularly reviewing regulations and how it impacts small businesses. So I think we can continue doing that. Um, you know, cost of health care. Um, we have not talked about that, um, and we have had conversations I have. with, so you and I have talked about that, <laughs> but you, um, I would say that, you know, we have had conversations with healthcare providers uh, to figure out what we, we can do as government to actually help offset the cost of 
um, healthcare. It is very, very complicated, um, actually more complicated than even our regulatory uh, work. Um, uh, but that might be something that Great. we can work together Mentioned on. Mentioned three and, areas. Let's focus. Okay. Capital regulations, which you also encumbers fines, and then thirdly, health care. Yep. Now, capital. I brought this up to you before. Why aren't we opening up a um, community bank, not for profit, that allows bids to borrow money at lower interest rates, that allows bids to deposit money and get higher interest rates? That'd be a wise investment. When it comes to regulations, and we're going to get into SB1, one of my favorite topics of discussion, three years, $27 million, you have not achieved what it was intended to do. I'll let you interpret. And third, health care, because when we empower these bids, these 76 bids, and allow them to buy coverage together, they're going to pay lower premiums, not only for those bids, but they can become the premier model for other small businesses to join in to their group to pay lower health care. So, so let's start with the last part in terms of the health care. It's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and I'll be happy to actually have a conversation with you. Uh, it's not just about the volume, uh, but it's also the type of uh, individuals. Uh, it's also the complexities of our health care laws um, and what and how um, uh, it's priced based on who the, the, um, the, the um, individuals that are covered um, will be. Um, so we, are, we have, you know, we had conversations with um, a health care provider. Um, and we were able to at least recognize about maybe 3% savings to think about like group purchasing. Mm -hmm. It is a conversation and we will continue working on that and be happy to, to continue uh, with that. We have a lot I of questions. Say, as, I, I, would, I would push back on, on I know you, there's more questions, but the la I'll stop after this. Uh, I disagree that with your assessment that we have not accomplished uh, anything with SB1. If you look at what we promised uh, with the Small Business First, uh, the 30 initiatives. Um, there is still a lot more work to do, uh, but we have accomplished a lot. Uh, you may not agree with what- I believe the whole premise was to remove outdated um, It was more than just, it was more, it was not only reviewing regulations, it was to build uh, and bring transparency to the regulatory environment. Let's talk about the review. Was, Let's talk about the review and get rid of outdated uh, regulations. How many of those have we done in three years? Going on year four now, correct? Correct. I believe it's 80 of the 6,000 rules and regulations, which we always so, have a debate on 5,300, 6,000. Right, but, but you're also- And they've been modified. But you're also, you're also lumping every single regulations together, and those, some of those regulations are, for example, that you have to keep food at a certain temperature, that you shouldn't have mice and vermin in your, your establishment. Uh, so there are regulations that we want to keep on the books, I would hope, um, and there are some that we have worked I'm okay with. with regulations. I have a problem with the fines that are associated with those regulations that can that determine whether or not a small business can survive. Right. And when you get hit with a $5,000 fine for having an illegal sign, which took over a year, a year to get done. Uh, Commissioner, I just want to hit on so many other points. I'm I with know. you. We're going to work on it. But just for the record, there is a lot more that we can be doing. I want to hit on the, besides SB1, on the, the $100,000 job plan through CUNY. Can you elaborate where we are uh, with the mayor's commitment to double the number of CUNY graduates with computer science degrees as outlined in New York City Works, creating good jobs report? There was a promise that was made that we're going to double the number of CUNY graduates, and these graduates are going to start up with $100,000 jobs. What is the role that you've been playing in meeting this target? What was the target? Um, and can you update us on this goal? So, so the goal um, was by 2022, uh, so we're still very early on. Um, right now, we've, um, we've done a couple things. Um, we've updated and helped CUNY, uh, the CUNY schools that are participating to add additional faculty um, to actually teach. It's a tech and residence program uh, because one of the things that the tech companies told our, 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 our presidents of the, the CUNY schools is that the reason why they're not recruiting their students is because their students are still learning 
older languages. Mm -hmm. I mean, folks are still learning like COBOL and, and Pascal, et cetera, et cetera, where now everyone is looking at like agile development, et cetera. Then there's also um, the um, working in groups um, because, um, and the group projects, because that's where a lot of the new tech companies are, that's the type of, that's the environment they have. Um, yeah, but Commissioner, how much money have we put into this program thus far, and how many $100,000 jobs have we actually created from this program? So they're, they're not $100,000. It, so it's part of the mayor's 100000 job plan, okay. but that was for to connect people to f jobs that are paying 50000 50000 I'm sorry, right. right. 100000 jobs, uh, so 50000 uh, First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mellon uh, talk about how much we've invested so far. But I just want to make sure you understand that we're still early on and we're addressing uh, different issues that the tech companies have addressed that have said to our uh, city uh, education system. So just to re reiterate, it's a, the investment is a combination of, a, of multiple things. We're at three schools currently, and we're gonna be adding others, and it's a five-year initiative. So we're, we're augmenting the schools with, with faculty. Right, what's the dollar amount? For faculty specifically? And no, total. The, the total initiative is what, $10 million? It's over five years, it's $10 million. It's a combination of CTL and, and federal. Like we can get you specifics year by year because we ramp it, it, it ramps up. But it, the faculty to ensure that people can get through the, um, the, the computer science uh, degree because they're, they're, they're blocked now, they don't have enough people for the core courses. Advisement so that they are, are uh, very familiar with what's required to get a job in tech afterward. And then as Greg said, the tech and residence where we're industry is participating and delivering modern courses so that they can compete. And then ten years, there are residents. I'm sorry, I'm, that was $10 million over, $5 million or yeah. $10 million? It's 20, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's so so far, million over yeah. five years. so far we've spent, Federal so far we've spent, uh, we're invested over $2 million at, at three colleges. Uh, and the idea of the program, as um, um, as we said, is that we will add additional schools. Um, right. And right now, we have City College, Hunter College, and Lehman College. And we expend we ex we expect to expand to three additional schools this year. Um, and then we will continue adding schools. Again, th that's the the total commitment is twenty million dollars. Chair, I I, I want to make sure that we give the other council members. Um, an opportunity to ask their questions, and I'll come back. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Councilmember Moya. Now that I got them ready for you. Count, uh, we, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Cornegie and uh, Councilmember Moya, followed by Miller, have questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair Jonai. Commissioner, uh, always good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, just a quick question. Could you tell me what the overall budget is for uh, the Workforce One program? Uh, SBS share of, yeah. of Workforce One, we're about... It's Do you mean specifically the, the, the centers? Yeah. It's like 30, 27 million, 30 million-ish, right? Yeah, 25, 27, depending on the year. Okay. Um, and in regards to the career paths program, do you know what the uh, average wage for careers uh, in the construction industry is? Uh, construction specifically? You, specifically construction? Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's a range of like $16 to $40 an hour, depending upon the, 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 trade. The, the trade and the type of- Do you have a breakdown of- I, we could get it to you. I just don't great. have it handy. That would be great. Yeah. And do the funds that are, alloc uh, are allocated for that, uh, are they allocated for the metrics uh, of career paths that includes the study of the efficacy of higher NYC? I but sorry, uh, could you repeat? So the, the funds that are allocated for the career, career path pathways, program. So for us, career pathways was focused on uh, standing up the industry partnerships, uh -huh. um, which has different um, and trainings. Uh, so, um, when you say f focus on the higher NYC program, and so higher NYC is, is separate. So the, apart. the 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 funding for career paths doesn't go into anything that has to do with higher NYC. Not really. 
So remember, so higher higher OIC um, was our attempt to address the the fact that legally we cannot tell a company to hire locally. Um, so using um, the work that and contracts that either you know uh, HPD, EDC, or even some of the goods and services, uh, we are now telling. Um, companies that if you have a contract um, over a certain percent, um, then you need to tell SBS uh, that you either are hiring or not hiring, and if you are hiring, SBS will give you, um, or there will be a first pass in terms of we will give you candidates. Okay. Uh, so it's, re it's really using SBS's Workforce One system uh, to actually address um, the uh, attempt to uh, hire locally. Got it. Um how many individuals have applied to jobs through Hire NYC? So in terms of, and when you say, so let me, let me explain to you how it works. So I can tell you, so since I, the start, I know how it works. I just want to know if you have the numbers of individuals that have applied right. to so Hire we, NYC. Yeah, so we've had 700. And Chair, can you just indulge me for a few minutes? Sorry, uh, Sorry. so we've had of, of the employer commitments, meaning these are open jobs that employers said that they had, it was about 753. And of those, we've been able to place 663 into jobs. So 663 individuals uh, have been employed through Higher NYC. Correct. Since when? Uh, since the start of the program, since 2016. So since 2016 and we're in 2019, we've had how many hires? 663. 663. Do you know how many actually applied? 753. Well, there was 753 opportunities. Right. I'm asking how many individuals have applied for jobs through Higher NYC. Yeah. I don't have the specific number for those jobs, but I can tell you typically um, we see maybe eight or ten people who are interested in a job who we can determine that, like, somewhere between three and five are actually a fit for the job, and then they are, and they are referred, and then So, so going with that, it. how many individuals have been interviewed or considered? Uh, I wouldn't know off the top of my head for these specific jobs, but our, we are managing our, our, our vendors that run our, our career centers to, to send three qualified candidates and get a, a, a hire out of it. And generally speaking, overall, in the aggregate, they tend to, to meet that goal, if that makes any sense, the way I've said it. Happy to. How many employers have participated in Higher NYC? Uh, I don't know the specific number of, of employers, but there are 1,600 plus contracts that have been enrolled. So we don't have. Uh, I, don't we could get it to you. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, and what are the wages that are paid to the individuals hired uh, via Higher NYC's program? It, there's, there's, a, there's a range, um, anywhere between $15 to $30, depending on uh, the, the, the job and the, the contract. And do we know what the links of those employment of the, uh, of the workers are through Higher NYC? No. But, no, they're, they're hiring for full-time positions, though, but we don't, we, if you're asking, do we track subsequent to their being hired, how what happens, um, not on a job-by-job -job basis. Do we know the zip codes yes. of the uh, participants of the program? We do. And we could share that information. That'd be great. Uh, and this is my, my, my last question. Uh, so, Higher NYC has no re uh, wage requirement, correct? What, what do you mean wage requirement? Sorry. So the program doesn't have a wage requirement for uh, any uh, contractor or someone that's coming in there uh, to participate in hire an individual through Hire NYC. There's no wage requirement, correct? Well, as a, as a overall for um, our workforce system, we have made um, a focus on a, in, installing a wage floor uh, because we believe that everyone deserves a living wage. Um, so we would not. But is there a specific wage requirement that you have with this program? I mean, the, the way the program operates is it's to figure out ways we can actually hire like, and connect local individuals too. So no, there isn't a wage requirement, but based on the average wages that we've seen, um, it fluctuates between 15 and $30. I, I ask because, I, I, you know, uh, 
how does the city then plan to ensure creating good paying jobs without setting an actual wage requirement? So I would say, you know, uh, so the, uh, our deputy mayor, Phil Thompson, is very focused on, on local hiring and- I, uh, he's, he's a great man. And, and, and I would say that, that the city I'm, has- I'm looking forward to, to working with, with uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson on this. But I, I'm running out of time and I'm just gonna say this. I, this is the very same questions I asked you during my Inwood uh, rezoning hearing. It's the same questions I've asked every single person from your department for the last three rezonings that I've done, one that happened on Tuesday. I've heard you consistently say, you're gonna get back to me, and every time I ask these questions, you still don't have an answer for them. And I think it's very troubling that I would have to come here time and time again to ask the simplest of questions for a program that I have both said to you uh, at these hearings and in private when we've met that I really would like to see the information on whether or not this uh, program is being uh, run appropriately. And yet every single time we are here, there's still no answer to these questions. And, and I just find it very, very difficult uh, to take the word of this agency when it can't get these simple answers to someone now going on over a year. Uh, I look forward to the opportunity again to continue to work with you, but this is just unacceptable. Um, this is affecting uh, many, many New Yorkers, low-wage workers uh, in uh, a field of construction uh, that we've seen as an epidemic now in the city of New York. 69 construction workers have died uh, since 2017, uh, and we need to make sure that uh, the funding that we're giving uh, to agencies uh, that the city is running uh, is going to be effective uh, for those that uh, uh, are the most uh, uh, affected by this. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Chair, uh, for indulging me with the time. Uh, I appreciate the testimony here today. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Chair, and the co-chairs. So um, I have a few questions in this, I, and, and I'm going to forego my uh, so, Councilmember Carnegie is no longer there, so I will ask you about the support for MWBEs, and 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 I'll begin there, and and, and what that looks like, and and the um, whether it's the capital program, the other programs that have been in effect, give us an overview of of its impact on the MWBE community. Uh, are we seeing more uh, or less folks? Um, being able to avail themselves of opportunity within the city here, and it speaks specifically to to that and agency wise. And so, so, um, so there's a couple of things we've seen um, a number of new opportunities for MWBs. Uh, so some of it is related to our legislative push. Um, so, for example, um, the fact that we were able to get the state to increase the discretionary level to up to $150,000. Um, we see new MWBEs, which is also important to us, actually um, get contracting opportunities. A number of agencies are using that innovative procurement method um, to connect MWBEs to um, opportunities. Uh, we can, just yesterday we had um, the mayor talk to, to all the agency heads and, and, and stressed again the importance of uh, uh, doing all we can uh, to connect to MWBEs um, to opportunities. Um, there's been an increase in the amount um, of uh, awards to MWBEs. Uh, we are about 20% utilization. Um, you know, when the administration started, we were hovering about 6%. So, you know, we're not there yet, um, and we continue to invest in resources to not only build capacity, uh, we are um, looking at, for example, we talked about the capital uh, access program to make sure that we give university um, uh, MWBEs uh, the resources they need to operate on those jobs. Um, we have provided and we've been, uh, the administration has been very generous in supporting our um, uh, services to MWBs in terms of staffing um, and services. Uh, so for example, we provide technical assistance uh, to MWBs. Um, we are also looking at non-mayoral agencies and ensuring that they have a path uh, to increase their utilization of MWBs. So overall, I would say that um, you know we've done a lot. There's still more to go because we want to make sure 
um, that we are breaking down barriers. And there are some barriers, for example, insurance costs uh, for MWBs, especially in construction, uh, that's an issue. Uh, we want to make sure that we have more flexibility to create mentorship programs um, that we, because of state law, are not allowed to do. Uh, so there's a legislative agenda that on the state side that we're um, uh, also pursuing uh, to ensure that we uh, provide every opportunity for MWBs to be successful. So, is it, it, so, um, and, and I want to be able to, to move on, but is there a, a, a particular number that we can get at? Where, where, where was our start number? Um, and, and I know we're talking about 6% to 20%, but where is our start actual n number of, of contracts and, and where are we now? Are, are we finding that um, this is a capital infrastructure project or these are in purchase and, and, and where are they and what agencies are, are, are doing better than others? Um, for, for uh, small businesses, um, and uh, my colleague, the, the chair, mentioned uh, the, the, the enormous amount of regulations that we have here, and, and some of the things that the council has implemented uh, over the um, past uh, administration and what impact that has had on small businesses in terms of uh, paid sick and, and, and other uh, initiatives. and, and at the conversation, in fact, we have an upcoming uh, uh, hearing on uh, paid annual leave as well. Um, certainly that this has had an impact on, on small businesses, those businesses, five businesses or, or, or more. Um, what specifically in terms of programming and assistance have we provided to small businesses uh, to kind of counteract those initiatives? Right, so, you know, there, there's, um, and, and we talked about some of the, the support that we're giving. Um, I think what we're, we're looking at is how we reduce expenses in other places. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, through our, love, for example, our Love Your Local program is to test different interventions and figure out where we need to focus um, our services on. Um, so uh, we sent out trained um, uh, business advisors uh, to review of over 100 businesses that were part of the program. Um, and we are now, uh, we have about 40 businesses that are, are participating in um, a reimbursable grant program up to $90,000 to address some of those challenges. Um, so there's, uh, there's areas that we know, and we talked about this earlier in terms of access to capital, um, you know, getting the right employees, um, looking at healthcare costs. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, I would say that, you know, when you look, talk to small businesses, I, paid six is not actually an issue. Um, you know, it's it's really the, the cost of wages. Um, so, um, how do you, we how do we help businesses? And we have talked to businesses. And when we advise small businesses, if you want good employees, you have to pay them a good wage. Um, uh, but there are some in sectors that we're sensitive to. For example, the restaurant sector, uh, where you have um, thin margins. Um, and so with the increase of, of wages on one part of the, the, the business, it pushes and puts pressure on another part. Uh, so we continue to work with um, um, you know, um, small businesses to figure out ways we can address that. So I, I, listen, as, as the chair of labor, I, any time that we're creating opportunities and, and quality uh, uh, working conditions for, for workers, I can I absolutely appreciate that. Um, but certainly we want to make sure that they have jobs to go to. And, and so, and that means that we have to, so EDC in the past has, has uh, received, uh, business, ha have given numerous uh, subsidies, uh, large subsidies to businesses in, in, in hopes that they would create uh, uh, jobs. Um, uh, oversight has shown that they have not necessarily met their goals, um, but if in fact that is a model that can be duplicated, is that something that you would consider for, for smaller businesses that we can subsidize uh, smaller businesses that are creating these employment opportunities yeah. in some shape, form or fashion? Right, without understanding which particular program because a lot of uh, the programs that EDC has is um, you know, uh, based on, on um, performance. So it's in lieu of paying, for example, taxes, in lieu of, of ex or, um, tax on equipment, et cetera. Um, so it's not necessarily a, a grant to a particular large organization. Um, you know, we, that's part of the reason why we looked at Love Your Local, um, to figure out, you know, what 
other services we as a city could possibly build out uh, to help address uh, the challenges that small businesses have. You know, one of the things we found out was a lot of small businesses don't have an inventory management system, for example. Uh, so based on, you know, what we find out from this program, because it is a pilot, um, one of the, one of the, the um, you know, recommendations from us could be that SBS provides, um, you know, uh, assistance with getting inventory management systems. I mean, that, that could be a possibility, but we are right now in the middle of testing uh, those interventions, and then we will be able to uh, figure out a, a course of action in the future. Yep, we'd love to see you step up that assistance. And then finally, I want to talk about the headcount reduction. And, and how is it that we continue to provide these critical services as efficiently as possible when we diminish the human capital, particularly as the, uh, my colleague over there just mentioned, uh, uh, construction safety and, and, and other areas that we know that, that, that'll uh, be diminished in terms of right. funding, and, 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 and most importantly, the headcount. Is that, um, is, ha has the programming not just there, but in other places going away? Do we no longer need that? Or are we creating the extra burden for the workforce that's left there? So, uh, you know, we are, we are, are, are attempting, uh, working with, you know, OMB and, and council uh, to make sure that we continue uh, the right level of service. Um, and one of the things, and we talked about this a little bit earlier with construction safety, when we designed construction safety, um, we had a number of personnel um, requests. Uh, but however, working with uh, and building out the, the tech, using technology um, and also using um, partners, uh, we've been able to reduce the amount of personnel that we need. Um, so that's some of the numbers that you're seeing. Uh, but we'd be happy to, and you know, my, my focus has always been um, ensuring that we continue the same level of services, um, but happy to go so, into details with you. Um, so I, I would submit based on what we've seen to continue and, and, and listen, this is not somebody doesn't show up and something happens. We're talking about deaths and lives here. Um, the fact that it continues um, at almost the same rate is something that we certainly uh, reevaluate to make sure that we're giving it the, 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 the gravitas that it absolutely deserves, that we can save lives, as well as, look, the city, the services that, it, that are being provided from, this, uh, from its workforce has value. Uh, it gives the city values, the reason why 67 million people come here. Um, we should take that into consideration when we start diminishing the workforce because then we diminish services and, you know, at, at every level, whether it's public safety or in, in the business sector, it doesn't right. matter. It, it, it yeah. has an impact. Yeah, we hear you, and, 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 that is, and we are certainly sensitive to that. Chair Jonai. Those are some great questions, uh, Council Member. Um, I also suggest that we actually begin working on a single certification for our WMBEs for both city and state, instead of this city first and <coughs> state later and the complications that come about that where we have missed opportunities. Um, that would be something that SBS then can really put a feather in their cap on, and I wouldn't even challenge. Um, I, tr I truly see your agency as a partner or the potential for a partner to make a difference in the lives of those business owners. But not enough comes out of your agency when it comes to the unfunded mandates that are placed on small businesses, whether it be health care, minimum wage violations, uh, where you're standing up for those small businesses alongside of them and pushing back on this administration or um, a state-imposed mandate that truly undermines their business models. One in particular, yesterday we had a very passionate hearing on Furban. Those are small businesses. I didn't hear SBS take a position. I have not heard SBS take a position on clear curbs. I did not hear SBS take a position on Vision Zero, the road dieting, against major opposition from our small business owners. Can you help me understand how on one end we say SBS is the agency that's going to fight for our small businesses, 
On the other hand, SBS is silent when it comes to some of the policies, whether it comes through the city council, the administration of the state, that you're not vocal enough saying, I'm going to take this fight on with you. So I, so I would say that, that it's a little bit unfair to say that SBS, you have not heard from SBS. Sometimes, um, you know, there's a lot of conversations that happen behind the scenes. Um, and we are at the table. Um, you know, the, for example, the fur ban um, just happened yesterday, um, but we were um, actually in conversation with uh, all the necessary uh, parties um, in terms of what it means and what the, what the effects would be with um, on, on small businesses. Uh, we talked about this with the road dieting and clear curbs. Um, when we see that there's an impact on small businesses, um, I am one of the first to go to either, you know, uh, the administration, uh, my, my team over at, at, and the folks over at City Hall or uh, my counterparts at different agencies uh, to talk about what we can do. Um, so we, and we will continue doing this. <coughs> I'm sorry, we, we have um, not only uh, established as part of, I know you love this, but uh, you know, small business first, uh, we have a committee of not only the regulatory agencies, uh, but members of each of the deputy mayor's team uh, as part of that committee. Um, and that's where we bring up these issues. Um, and so we so are always, it, we are- tell, Help me better understand, you bring it up to the administration, and then what happens? And I'm gonna well, use- Well, I mean, let's, let's talk about Claire Curbs. I mean, you know, I've, uh, based on conversations we heard not only from small businesses, but from you, uh, from other council members that were affected by it, from the business improvement districts that contacted us about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we raised this issue. Um, you know, the, the um, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg was very responsive. Um, you know, Deputy Mayor Anglin was very responsive. Uh, we went out, uh, actually you went out Several multiple times. times. Yeah. Uh, I went out with you and we talked to the business owners. I sent a summary of that conversation in terms of the impact that it has, uh, it was having on business owners and then you saw the result, which was uh, dialing back um, that, that pilot. Commissioner, um, the damage was done. That was irreversible. Businesses actually shut <coughs> down. They're not coming back. This was, where were we ahead of the implementation? And I'll tie that now into the Morris Park Road Dieting. Over 100 businesses will share a 30-foot section for deliveries. Impossible to meet the needs of those small business owners. I worked relentlessly with this administration, ass top, down, down, up. It doesn't work for this commercial corridor. We have a Metro North coming in. It's the only corridor that connects two Metro Norths coming in, plus leads to two major hospitals, hundreds of businesses. I've got some that have received notice from their, in particular, a window company. Said, we will not supply you, your, you'll have to place your orders with another company. We cannot deliver your product. And we're not going to wheel that product down the sidewalks for three blocks. Too much liability. Zero cooperation. Zero willingness to sit down and work. On top of this commercial corridor, fire department, and yesterday we had hearing on the NYPD and the response times that it had compared to the rest of the city. The borough of the Bronx was at the very bottom. We had the, hot, the longest response times to emergencies. And just so the record, that's taking two driving lanes and creating one driving lane. Leaving virtually no room for double parking, delivering, picking up in a commercial car though where there is, isn't enough adequate parking to begin with. So how are we helping these small businesses? We're hurting them. Not only hurting them, we're making sure that if they defeat the odds of box competition, of internet and consumer changes, we're gonna make sure that we're the nail in their final coffin. If they can even 
get through the regulations and the fines that they pay and the real estate tax increases, we're going to make sure that we really destroy them. We need a real partnership to be vocal, and I know that it's not easy to be that vocal or passionate to an administration that I truly believe takes the position we know best. We heard you and we're still gonna implement what we think is in the best interest. Commissioner, this isn't about let's test and see what happens. There is consequences that are paid by our policies that, are, that will determine whether or not a small business survives whether or not they can keep their doors open, whether or not they can keep their employees without making cuts. And the scare that we're not even addressing is when we lose this tax base, when we lose, first of all, these vibrant commercial corridors that make our community such a great place to live and thrive and the ability to walk out of your home to be able to buy products and services so you enjoy and benefit from where you live, when we lose these businesses, with that, we'll lose an incredible tax base. And we won't have a well to make up from it, from that loss. That's why I'm so passionate. And I need you to be as passionate for them. When you talk to this administration on the effects of their policy, and we know what's best. Any response? <laughs> so, I, so I would say that. So, number one, we we are um, we share the same passion. We want to make sure that we we see our businesses thrive. Um, we want to make sure that you know our neighborhoods have uh, businesses that are thriving, that are growing. Um, you know, we, our voice is um, one of many, um, as you can imagine, in a complicated city as this. Um, when you see actions uh, where there's, uh, you know, reconfiguring of roads, et cetera, et cetera, there's a balance between pedestrian safety, uh, biker safety. Uh, there are many, many different, uh, um, you know, groups that are sharing the same road. Uh, our job is to make sure that whatever is implemented does not have uh, a detrimental impact on the small businesses, and so we are on the same page. I think the the, the question, and you know, um, there are things that, in in terms of if a decision is made, uh, our job is to make sure that we um, uh, provide as m as much resources and services to those small businesses to either adapt to that change or to reverse that decision, uh, depending on, on what it is. So let's uh, so talk about I, that. I'm just gonna, well, yeah. I, wanna be, I wanna be proactive and not reactive. Dykeman Heights, you were a part of the conversation when Vision Zero was applied? Uh, I was not part of the conversation. I was part of the conversation when the businesses with the installation of the bike lanes, right. uh, and I'm, I continue to be part of that conversation. Right, and there was a reversal that was done. I, I wouldn't say reversal. Um, because the so the, the the appearance is that there was a reversal. However, um, it's one of those situations where DOT placed the markings for the bike lanes, and then there was the normal cycle of resurfacing the road. So it seemed that there was a reversal, but it was actually that road was uh, teed up to actually get repaved. Um, but because of the concerns and because of uh, what we heard from small businesses, there's now a conversation, um, because typically what happens when you repave a road, you just put the markings back the way it was. But now there's a conversation about, because we've heard from small businesses and we've heard from the community, what should we make adjustments? And that's, that's one of the things I was gonna say is that, you know, um, our, my sister agencies and, and you, know, um, you know, the different agencies that deal with small businesses, they are very responsive mm -hmm. when they hear about concerns. Right, uh, stay on that point, you were doing great. But it was after it was implemented that we went back to revisit. And not enough thought went into the implementation 
this cookie cutter approach, vision zero, take two lanes, make it in one, put a bike lane, it's, is where we're headed. I don't, I don't think, and, and you know, I don't want to make this into a DOT hearing, uh, but no, I don't but it's think, a small business I, I, hearing. I, right, I know, but I don't, I don't think it's a cookie cutter approach. Uh, you know, when DOT makes a decision, they're making a decision based on safety. Um, they want to make sure that lives are saved, and I don't think anyone make an argument that if DOT makes a change to a, a, a street uh, and we we see a reduction in fatalities, um, you know that, you. that that we that is something to be said, right? I am completely with you on this. We should strive to make things safer, and we should be looking at options that we have. Do you know that Morris Park, that same commercial corridor, a report came out which deep by DOT deprioritized the commercial corridor based on a 40% reduction. This is their findings. And they're reporting. Deprioritized. I says, great. Now we can sit back and revisit this and try to figure out a balance. You know what the response was? Nope, we're moving forward because we know best. I said, why don't we take some initial steps ahead of this? Let's stagger the traffic lights. Seven of them turn green at the same time. Let's slow down those cars. Not interested. Let's put in speed cameras. Not interested. Let's use better markings for our crosswalks. Not interested. These were suggestions that were made by those small businesses. These were suggestions that were made by the community, the people that live there. These were the suggestions that were made by the community board. These were the suggestions that came out of town hall meetings. It was overwhelmingly opposed to this road dieting plan. Homeowners, business owners, residents, unanimously opposed. No willingness to work with the stakeholders. So I say to you as the Commissioner of Small Business Services, join in this conversation, which led us to a lawsuit. Could you imagine this? The only the final option, the nuclear option, had to be to sue New York City to stop the implementation. And a judge agreed and put in a temporary restraining order. Commissioner, this issue is significant to the well being of that commercial corridor. Please join me as we meet with both stakeholders and agency to devise a plan that can be embraced, that works, and doesn't jeopardize the safety of pedestrians at the cost of a vacant commercial corridor. We all have to live and share the same street and the same sidewalk. And I believe that we can come up with a approach where both sides will be unhappy, and that means we've done our job. <laughs> so you have my commitment in terms of, um, and you had mentioned this at the last hearing, and we will uh, continue your conversation with DOT. Together. Together. There you go. Strength in numbers. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and that will end it here with this panel. We're going to start in about 20 minutes, I think, or so, with, um, with uh, the um, Department of Health. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Again.
And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Council Chambers. If you have any food or beverages, please remove them from the chambers at this time. Any electronic devices, we ask you to please set to silent or vibrate. We are going to reconvene momentarily. Also, if you are here from the public and looking to testify, the date for public testimony is May 23rd at 2 p.m. Once again, it's May 23rd, next Thursday at 2 p.m. Thank you. Once again, if everyone can please find seats, we are going to start momentarily. And once again, if you are here to testify from the public, it will be next Thursday, May 23rd at 2 p.m. If you want to tell your friends and colleagues, once again, May 23rd at 2 p.m. Okay, good afternoon. We will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Health, chaired by Councilmember Mark Levine, and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction, chaired by Councilmember Ayala. We have been joined by a Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and other Council Members will be coming shortly. Um, we just heard from SBS, and now we will hear from Dr. Oxiris Barbeau, the Commissioner of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my colleague, uh, Council, Member, uh, Council Member Levine. Okay. Thank you, Chair Drum, and um, great to be co-chairing this hearing with Chair Ayala. And I'm very happy to see the administration. Um, as the chair mentioned, we're going to be reviewing today the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's $1.7 billion fiscal 2020 executive budget, as well as funding requests included in the council's preliminary budget response. Uh, amongst the most serious public health challenges faced in this city are 
an opioid epidemic, which is claiming the life of one New Yorker on average every seven hours, an ongoing fight against HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, and TB, diseases which disproportionately impact low-income communities, people of color, and immigrants, unconscionable racial disparities in maternal mortality, and inadequate nurse staffing in our public schools. The mayor's executive budget for DOHMH falls short in addressing each of these challenges. The City Council's budget response called for funding of opioid overdose prevention centers, a critical, innovative, and life-saving strategy. We hope and expect that the centers will be authorized soon by the State Health Department. And it's important to have funding in place now to advance this so that no further time is lost. Unfortunately, the administration's executive budget does not allocate any funding for this important strategy to fight overdose deaths. The state budget this year made a devastating and indefensible $60 million plus cut to Article 6 health care funding, a cut directed exclusively to New York City. Thankfully, the administration has committed to filling this gap for funding, at least that portion directly allocated to DOHMH. The executive budget, however, makes no provision for replacing the Article 6 funding directed to community-based health care nonprofits engaged in critical public health work. Unless this shortfall is addressed, it will mean approximately $4 million in painful cuts to programs helping our city in the battle against HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, TB, and much more. The City Council's budget response also called for an increase in funding to the Nurse Family Partnership, an initiative which, amongst other things, provides care to low-income women during and immediately after pregnancy, an important tool in closing the maternal mortality health gap. Unfortunately, the administration's executive budget does not allocate any additional funding for the Nurse Family Partnership. Finally, our budget response called on the administration to close the salary gap for school nurses. Currently, there is a substantial pay disparity between school nurses who work for DOHMH and those who work for DOE, even though they are doing the same jobs in our schools. The poor pay for DOHMH nurses has resulted in numerous unfilled positions, which has meant some schools must, must go without this vital position on some days. Again, the executive budget made no provision for closing this pay gap. I look forward to a robust discussion on these issues with our colleagues, with the administration, so that we can work together to protect and promote the health and well-being of all New Yorkers. And I'm now pleased to pass it off to my colleague and the chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, Councilmember Diane Ayala. Thank you, Chair Levine, and good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Diane Ayala, chair of the City Council's Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I would like to start by reiterating my colleague's concern that no funding has been allocated for the start of overdose prevention centers. We're fighting a losing battle against opioid addiction. It is imperative that we do everything in our power to keep the citizens of New York City safe. Addiction is a disease, a disease that's con that whose consequences can be deadly. The science proves that overdose prevention centers reduce the number of overdose deaths drastically. To turn to the City Council's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget response, I would like to express my disappointment that the request to increase the rate of scattered supportive housing wasn't addressed in the executive budget. The consequences of not addressing the rate of this disparity will, cost, will be costly for the OHMH and New York City as a whole. These units keep people out of shelters and emergency rooms. Ignoring the inequalities between the different supportive housing programs implies that organizations providing supportive services are less of a priority. The budget response also calls for more transparency and clarity on the funding for Thrive NYC. I was disappointed to see that the only cut in funding was for the program that has been known to be underutilized. Historically, spending for Thrive leads the council to believe that there will be significant underspending in fiscal year 2019 and fiscal year 2020. For example, there is almost full funding for diversion centers, but the program hasn't yet begun. 
I want to thank the Thrive NYC office and OMB for the efforts and communication over the last few months, but I believe that we can continue to dive deeper into the details to ensure a successful and robust mental health program in New York City. I look forward to discussing these important issues, and I would like to turn it back to Chair Drum. Thank you very much, and I'm going to ask Council to swear the panel in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Okay. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairs Drum, Ayala, and Levine, and members of the committee. I am Dr. Oxidis Barbeau, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I am joined by Sandy Raza, Deputy Commissioner for Finance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify our, on our executive budget for fiscal year 2020. This is my first executive budget hearing as commissioner, and Chair Drum, I look forward to working with you and your staff. The department's primary focus since the preliminary budget hearing has been to address the ongoing measles outbreak. The department's response has been nothing short of epic, with nearly 400 employees mobilized for this public health emergency. To date, the department has spent $2.3 million. This includes redeployment of staff to the measles response and more than $700,000 in overtime and purchases for vaccines, supplies, and outreach materials and services. As of May 13th, there were 498 cases of measles in the city. Though cases continue to rise, we are confident our efforts are working. Since October, 23,814 doses of the measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR vaccine, have been administered to people under 19 years of age in Williamsburg and Borough Park, nearly double the amount given during, during the same period the previous year. We continue to work with community leaders, local health care providers, and other stakeholders to disseminate accurate information on the effectiveness and safety of the MMR vaccine and risks of acquiring measles. This has required a sustained effort because we are faced with a well-funded anti-vaccination movement that is not unique to the Orthodox community, but one that has effectively taken root. Let me be clear, the misinformation spread by anti-vaccination groups is based on non-science and is 100% false. As a pediatrician, I have administered thousands of MMR vaccines, and as I told my patients then, and now as the city's doctor, the best way to prevent measles and safeguard your child's health is to get vaccinated. I want to thank Chair Levine for his leadership and voice on this issue. It is vital that we have the city's leaders speak out about the mistruths that are perpetuating this outbreak. Before turning to the executive budget, I'd like to give an update on the state and federal budgets. During our preliminary budget hearing, I raised the very concerning issue of state budget cuts to Article 6 funding, which supports numerous core public health activities in New York City, such as responding to a measles outbreak. I was very disappointed to see that the governor pushed to keep the reduction in Article 6 match from 36 to 20 percent in the final budget. As a result, the department has lost $59 million annually in state aid. I cannot stress enough the enormity of this cut, which affects only New York City. As you heard from the mayor and the Office of Management and Budget, the city's executive budget closes this gap with city tax levy dollars for the upcoming fiscal year. I'm grateful that, the mayor, that Mayor de Blasio has stepped up to cover the state's responsibility, but this is not a sustainable solution. This funding must be restored in next year's state budget. There was some good news in the state budget. The school-based health center funding cuts were again restored by the state legislature. We are grateful for this $3.8 million allocation, which will support the school-based health center sponsors who operate 164 clinics in schools across the city. Additionally, the state authorized Medicaid coverage for the National Diabetes Prevention Program. This will allow the department and other health care providers to expand access to an evidence-based program that has shown to delay 
or reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by as much as 50 percent. Finally, I am pleased that the state budget included a 20 percent statewide tax on e-cigarettes and vapor products. The rise in popularity of these products threatens decades of progress we have made in fighting youth tobacco and nicotine use. Since youth are particularly sensitive to price increases, measures that raise the price of these products are an effective strategy for reducing use amongst this vulnerable population. At the federal level, we have healthy skepticism about the administration's plan to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. New York City is a national leader in the effort to end the HIV epidemic by 2020, and we are closely following the development of the federal plan. With that said, it will be nearly impossible to end the epidemic if other cuts and policy changes proposed by the President are realized. These include cuts to Medicaid and Medicare and the Trump administration's continued efforts to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, fundamentally change the Title X program, and revoke protections for LGBTQ people. We must remain vigilant in order to ensure that all Americans continue to have access to quality, affordable health care. I will now turn to the fiscal year 2020 executive budget which adds $60 million annually to the department's budget. The majority of this new funding is the $59 million to fill the gap left by the state's cut to the Article VI program for New York City, which will prevent us from having to reduce the number of cooling tower inspections, decrease operating funds for school-based health centers, distribute fewer naloxone kits, and clean syringes and close two of our eight sexual health clinics. We thank the mayor for stepping up for public health during a time when the governor was unwilling to do so. In addition, the executive budget baselines $435,000 to continue the Culture of Health Worksite Wellness Program provided in collaboration with the Office of Labor Relations that empowers employees to live healthy, active lifestyles through the provision of key services and wellness programs, including smoking cessation, diabetes prevention, and nutrition programming. The executive budget also reflects over $8.4 million in savings for fiscal year 2020 and out years to meet the department's required PEG targets set by OMB. We work closely with OMB to find ways to achieve these targets while preserving existing service delivery. The department savings were achieved through citywide hiring free savings, reductions in administrative and contractual spending, temp and consulting services. In addition, we are reducing our citywide media campaign budget by approximately $350,000. I want to thank the mayor for the resources dedicated to the department in the executive plan and thank you to the speaker, Chairs Drum, Levine, Ann Ayala, and members of the committee for your partnership and shared commitment to protecting and promoting the health of all New Yorkers. I want to acknowledge my excellent leadership team who are here today with me and the more than 6,500 department employees for continuing to achieve so much on behalf of all New Yorkers. They bring expertise and passion to our work every day. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Um, before we get started, let me just say that we've been joined by Council Members Holden and Van Bramer. And um, congratulations on being, giving testimony at your first executive budget hearing. <laughs> Hopefully you'll survive. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about Thrive. During the OMB hearings on the executive budget, Budget Director Melanie Hartzog um, stated that Thrive New York City was on track to uh, accurately spend for the fiscal for fiscal 2019. What is the year-to-date spending for Thrive New York City? So um, the year-to-date spending, I think we will need to get back to you on. But I want to just sort of lead by saying that we at the health department are focused on ensuring that we maximize the resources that 
uh, are so vitally needed by New Yorkers. I think we all can agree that mental health has been a historically underfunded area, both at the national, state, and local level. And this administration has made tremendous investments in the health of New Yorkers that includes not just physical health, but uh, the mental health. Oh, thank you. I hope we can get that information um, as soon as possible, and um, I agree with you. You know, my family has been affected by mental illnesses as well, and so um, we don't doubt the sincerity of um, the First Lady and, um, and Commissioner, I guess, or Director Herman at this point, um, but we just need to get some information on it so that we can properly address it in the budget. Absolutely. Uh, is there a plan to include additional units of appropriation? in the budget, in Thrive's, in Thrive's budget? <clears throat> so I'll start and then I'll have um, Deputy Commissioner Raza uh, continue. We at the Health Department are committed to transparency in the budget that we have for Thrive. And um, I hope that you can see in the budget book that we have um, budget codes for the way in which we are spending that money. and. We would be more than happy to sit with council to go through any additional details to help uh, shed further light on how we are maximizing the Thrive dollars that are getting to our most underserved communities. So Commissioner, one of the um, priorities, excuse me, <clears throat> of the um, council has been to get additional units of appropriation from the administration. So um, we really would like to see that happen. I think particularly because Thrive goes across uh, so many different agencies that it would be help us, helpful to us to be able to track it. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, can we get an updated Thrive uh, executive budget? I'm sorry, say again? Can we get an updated Thrive budget, executive budget? Sure, we'd be happy to sit with council and go through the way in which we spend our money uh, allocated to the health department for Thrive. You don't have that today, though. We have what the total is, but is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. So um, the total amount of dollars that we have allocated for Thrive, I'm blank, $124 million for fiscal year 20. For fiscal year 20. Okay, thank you. In the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response, the council called for a $50 million reduction to Thrive's spending. The administration responded by reducing the Thrive Mental Health Service Corps fiscal 2019 budget by $9 million in the executive budget. Can you, uh, with full confidence, state that all funding for fiscal 19 will be spent by the end of the fiscal year? We at the health department are, have been extremely focused on ensuring that, again, we maximize the resources going to the community, and we will follow up with council on where we end up with those dollars. But that's been really an emphasis of mine um, since returning to the health department of ensuring that resources make it to where they're intended. So it is your intention then to spend all that money by the end of the fiscal? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. In the letter to the council from the Office of Thrive after the preliminary budget hearing, the office stated that there are two positions that are being privately funded. Those positions include a program imp implementation specialist and a Thrive in your workplace and employer ma uh, engagement manager. What is the source of the private funds for those two positions? So um, on that particular question, I would have to defer to the Office of Thrive and OMB for the particulars. Okay, uh, what else in Thrive's New York City budget is privately funded, anything else? Um, again, I would have to defer to the uh, Thrive Office and OMB for the particulars on that. And the 124 that you mentioned, that's for 19 or that's for 20? That's for 20. Oh, for 20, okay. Um, okay, I don't think there'll be other questions, but for me and for now, I'm going to go on to um, PrEP and PEP. On uh, DOHMH website, it states that uninsured individuals may be eligible for a patient assistance program to help pay for PrEP. It also provides a list of 13 health clinics in the city that provide PEP and PrEP 
services to uninsured persons. Can you describe the patient assistance program and the criteria to qualify for the program? Um, I'm going to start and then I'll have uh, Dr. Daskalakis come to the podium to give us a more detailed response. Um, I want to just start by saying that uh, we at the department have really been leaders at the state uh, in terms of moving New York City to end the epidemic. And we are, uh, I'm pleased to report on track for meeting those metrics in terms of significantly reducing the number of people newly diagnosed with um, the infection. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Daskalakis for those details. Oh, I have to swear him in. So, Council, do you want to swear him in? And by the way, we've been joined by Council Member Eugene. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to you, the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may proceed. <clears throat> so the specific question is about the uh, PrEP assistance program and PEP assistance programs. Um, in New York State, for individuals who are uninsured or have issues with potentially being uninsurable, uh, potentially because of immigration status, um, there's a program that the state supports called PrEP Assistance Program. The PrEP Assistance Program is a program that supports the health care that's associated with pre-exposure prophylaxis. So it's doctors or other healthcare provider visits and screening for HIV and sexually transmitted infections as well as uh, checks for kidney function, which is one of the, one of the um, medical monitoring uh, issues with PrEP. It does not cover drug. Um, the way that the, a drug is covered is through the use of a patient assistance program that's provided by the company that is the producer of the only drug appro approved for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is tenofovir emtricitabine fixed dose combination, also known as Truvada. Um, so the, uh, it, the places that are listed are, uh, are facilities that New York City funds through ending the epidemic uh, funds, uh, part of our PlayShare network, and those sites are additionally sites that have prep assistance programs, so we can direct folks to uh, navigate them to places where they can get support for pre-exposure prophylaxis, as well as uh, assistance in getting on the patient assistance program uh, by the company. PEP is a bit more complex. In fact, I'll say that New York City has been a leader in actually pushing pharma to create better strategies for uh, for allowing access to drug in the uh, in this occurrence of post-exposure prophylaxis, which is uh, an emergency. So it's very time sensitive. Um, so we have worked with the companies uh, to actually create uh, voucher programs that allow us and others to access drug quickly. Um, so the patient assistance programs are a bit more novel. Um, they're newer than the pre-exposure prophylaxis assistance programs, but um, they are functioning to deliver medicines to people who need them in a timely manner. What is the criteria to qualify for both? Yeah, so the criteria for, um, actually the criteria for PEP are, are, are pretty straightforward. If you're uninsured, you qualify. And if you uh, are underinsured, there are patient, there are copay assistance programs that you can access, so you can cover the gap that you may have. And, and, and that actually has been pretty useful. PrEP, um, you have to be uninsured, and I think that the, it is, uh, you have to have 500% or less of federal poverty line, depending on a number of people in your household to qualify for the pre-exposure prophylaxis program. That actually syncs with the New York State um, uh, PrEP assistance program. They have the same criteria so that the care and the drug are covered for the same people. I was very surprised to find out that police officers do not have that coverage. Um, we brought that to their attention, and the administration says that it's a uh, union issue that they need to bargain it, but um, it seems sad that those who protect us uh, are not eligible for this, um, you know, for those drugs. Um, so I, I would assume from your criteria also they're not avail they're, they're not eligible if because the, the salary is too high. Yeah, with the pre-exposure prophylaxis program that's supported by the company, if they have a salary that's too high or they have insurance, um, they potentially do not qualify for that support. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that information. Uh, diversion centers. In December 18, the administration announced that two vendors had signed leases to open the city's first two drop-off health diversion centers, providing short-term stabilizing services for individuals with mental health and substance use needs. It was also stated that the diversion centers were anticipated to be open by late 2019. 
Upon review of the fiscal 2020 executive budget, however, approximately 4.2 million was rolled from fiscal 19 to fiscal 20 for these diversion centers. So this funding is linked to the startup costs for opening the two new centers. Given the change in funding for the diversion centers, is the administration still on target to opening them by the end of 2019? So I am pleased to say that we have two very strong vendors and that after much uh, struggle with regards to uh, real estate, we now have two sites and we are on track for opening in fall of, of this year. Okay, and what, where are those sites? Um, there is currently, one is going to the 47th district, or as they say, the 4-7 uh, in the North Bronx, and the 2-5 in East Harlem. Okay, thank you. Um, measles, and I know you spoke a little bit about measles in your, uh, in your opening statement. As of May 13th, 19, there have been 498 confirmed cases of measles in Brooklyn and Queens since, since September. It has been reported that in some communities where the vaccination rates are particularly low, one reason for the low rates is anti-vaccination campaigns that are targeting members of those communities and providing misinformation. For example, it has been reported that in the Orthodox Jewish community, there are hotlines that people can call where false information about vaccines is disseminated. So does DOHMH outreach and campaign to get people vaccinated specifically address the targeted misinformation efforts? So thank you for the opportunity to give them a fuller update of our efforts on addressing this measles outbreak. It's the largest that we have uh, seen in the city since measles was declared eradicated in 2000. And it's a reminder that we can't take for granted previous public health uh, successes. And uh, we remain uh, committed to ensuring that the information that we put out regarding the safety and the efficacy of vaccinations, and specifically of the measles vaccination, makes it to all communities. This particular response has um, required us to really mobilize different tools than have previously been utilized because of the degree to which uh, the anti-vaccination community has really targeted particular communities spreading misinformation that is dangerous to health. And so as a result, for example, we have uh, deployed several rounds of robocalls to households uh, in the Williamsburg area, specifically those four zip codes that are affected, um, bringing to people's homes, if you will, correct information about the safety and efficacy of measles. Additionally, we have been working with uh, community-based organizations on the ground, specifically the Orthodox Jewish Nurses Association, which has been incredibly helpful in that face-to-face -face component in terms of the education. We have worked collaboratively with the health provider community, uh, and we have also worked with the religious community. Part of the challenge here is that um, the anti-vaccination community has really been quite successful, I'll say, in leveraging social media, and so we have uh, also taken to social media and are deploying a number of um, uh, educational campaigns that include both uh, hard copy, if you will, postings in terms of like bus shelters and other places in Williamsburg and then deploying those uh, in social media as well. So um, in addition, you know, we've got uh, several tools that are available to public health with regards to the use of um, commissioner's orders, both at the school level, at the individual level, and uh, as well as declaring this a public health emergency and compelling people to get vaccinated. And doctor, is, is a second shot necessary? Is that... So the requirements for measles vaccination have historically been one dose starting at 12 months of age, and then the second dose starting at four years of age. 
in this particular outbreak in the community that's affected in Williamsburg, we have added an additional uh, request for people to vaccinate their um, infants as early as six months of age. Really, the important thing here is there are certain members of the community that just can't get vaccinated. So infants from birth until just uh, before their six months, individuals who have compromised immune systems because perhaps they're going through chemotherapy, and women who are pregnant. And so part of the way in which we uh, stop this outbreak and protect our communities is by maximizing the number of community members who can get vaccinated actually do get vaccinated. What we have found is that since the beginning of this outbreak at the beginning of October, over 23,000 people have been vaccinated in Williamsburg and Borough Park, the two communities most affected by this outbreak, and that's roughly double what it was the same time last year. Unfortunately, at the same time, as you noted, we still have people becoming infected with measles. We have people that are hospitalized because of measles. We've had a significant number of individuals who've ended up in the intensive care unit all unnecessarily because this vaccine is safe and effective. So our goal is to make it as easy as possible for individuals to get vaccinated. And part of that includes ensuring that they have the correct information and we take the time to dispel any potential myths that may continue. So do you have plans about how you would follow up with the second shot? So we are um, working with health providers. We're uh, providing them technical assistance about how to use their electronic medical records so that individuals who are due for that second shot get that second shot. We are working with community-based organizations, again, to make it as easy as possible for individuals to stay on target with um, their immunizations. Within the school community, um, we do ongoing audits of school records to ensure that any student enrolled in a school is up to date on their immunization status and if they have a medical exemption or any other kind of exemption that they are properly excluded when in fact there is an outbreak. And we've been doing um, several audits during this outbreak to ensure that we reduce any possible additional venues for ongoing transmission. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about school nurse pay parity. In the 2020 preliminary budget response, the council called on the administration to eliminate the wage gap among school nurses. The average salary for a DOHMH school nurse is 54,573, approximately $12,000 less than DOE school nurses who uh, earn an average of $66,635. Currently, there are over 780 school nurses who work for DOHMH. Have there been any discussions on how to achieve pay parity for school nurses? So let me start by saying that through the Office of School Health, uh, our commitment is to the health and safety of students in all of our schools, and the nurses are the front line for this. Um, so we are uh, in conversations, have been in conversations with OMB, and my understanding is that this is now a collective bargaining issue. And how many vacancies do you have with school nurses? So to, to lead with, again, in terms of the commitment that we have to the health and safety of our students, every day, roughly 98% of our schools are covered. And for schools where a nurse may be absent, we utilize uh, agency nurses to ensure that we take every measure so that the health and safety of our students is maintained. And they're covered with a full-time nurse? They're covered through either um, agency nurses that would provide coverage throughout the day or depending on uh, other factors, there may be nurses that are pulled from another school, a nursing supervisor. Okay, thank you. Um, 
talk a little bit about decriminalizing sex work. A bill sponsored by State Senators Jessica Ramos and Julia Salazar was recently introduced uh, that would vacate trespassing and larceny convictions for sex trafficking victims if they can demonstrate that they were coerced by traffickers. A second bill sponsored by Senator Brad Hoylman and Assemblyman Richard Gottfried would end a statute criminalizing lawyering for the purposes of prostitution. As these two pieces of legislation gain momentum in the state legislature and in the city, what efforts have been made by DOHMH to provide community education services to sex workers and trafficking victims? As an agency, we are focused on ensuring that our messages reach the communities in need. And um, we are focused on efforts around harm reduction, be it related to HIV transmission, be it related to STDs, reproductive health. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with these two bills, but I, we will take a look and see and, and ensure that uh, we work collaboratively with members of, of council to again maximize uh, the opportunities to protect and promote the health of New Yorkers. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Chair Levine who has questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. And hello again, Commissioner. Hello. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I know you concur, it was really a dastardly deed that Albany cut Article 6 funding. It's really impacting the most vulnerable in the city. And it's money that is critical to some of the most complicated fights we have right now. And it's, it's our fights to contain diseases which require community partners on the ground who are reaching out to the affected populations, who are providing important education programming, provi providing peer support. This kind of work is just, it, it is essential to our strategy in ending the epidemic of HIV AIDS, of ending the viral hepatitis epidemic. Um, it's critical to containing tuberculosis. Uh, this one is also used in some of, as I mentioned in my opening statement, in some of the um, neonatal uh, programming and support for, for women during pregnancy. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just unthinkable that we would endure a setback in our fights on any of these critical public health priorities because of the cut of millions of dollars that would result from our failure to restore what Albany took away on Article 6. And uh, you cited in your opening statement uh, a commitment from the mayor to restore that portion of the cuts, which goes directly to uh, DOHMH. But we need the cuts restored that are going to hit these CBOs really hard. It's not a lot of money. Um, our current estimate is it's about $3.4 million. Um, that relevant to the size of the city budget and relative to the size of the DOHMH budget is really quite small. And you probably have unallocated funds that uh, you could recapture just for this purpose. And I did ask Director, uh, OMB Director Hartzog about this uh, last week, and I have to say I found her answer somewhat confusing. Um, but I think what she said was, because we don't yet know for sure just how much uh, the city council is going to allocate for these causes. We don't know what the Article 6 matching fund amount would be. And you know, that, that's really not an acceptable response. We've, these are initiatives dealing with the diseases I mentioned and the other health priorities I mentioned, which have been in place for years. They've had fairly stable funding. We know approximately what they'll be funded at next year. Um, we're pushing to increase them, but let's just agree that based on historic funding levels, we know how much the state had put into these organizations. And we do know that based on prior year uh, funding, it's, it's, we're estimating it to be 3.4 million. So why can't the administration just put 3.4 million in 
and uh, that would that would close the gap as we currently understand it, and it would avoid any pain for these very small nonprofits that, as I mentioned before, are doing critical critical work in tackling these diseases. Mr. Chair, I agree with you that um, our community partners are important to the overall success of the mission that we have to protect and promote the health of all New Yorkers. And uh, we are in ongoing conversations with OMB about this issue. Uh, would you care to elaborate on those conversations? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, at this point, all I can say is that we are in conversations about this issue. Um, I think that you know, the ongoing advocacy at the state level is going to continue because uh, it's not a sustainable way to really run critical public health uh, initiatives, and we see our partners as uh, vital components to that. So we're in ongoing conversations with OMB. And I, I'm not letting the state off the hook. They, they created this crisis. They deserve blame for this crisis. But the only way now to avert um, really negative impact in, in these public health priorities is if the city steps in to fill the gap. That's, that's unfortunately the situation we're in. The city has to step in, and the administration has the resources to do that, and we're going to be pushing very, very, very hard um, until we are certain that none of these important public health programs are going to be impacted. Um, I do want to say a word about measles, which uh, I do want to commend the department in being extremely aggressive uh, in addressing, and I was impressed to see that you've got 400 personnel have been mobilized on this. Um, there was a, a convening Monday night uh, north of the city in Muncie that was one of the most shockingly shameful gatherings uh, related to public health that I've ever been aware of, where a rogues gallery of conspiracy theorists and fraudsters descended on this community to push a lot of bogus science, um, junk science around vaccinations. There were people from New York City who were there as well. Uh, this attracted people from all over the region. Um, uh, it's really, really frustrating because there have been um, incredibly strong leaders from within the Orthodox community have spoken out, including now over 600 doctors who work within the Orthodox community in New York City, primarily in other places. Um, and it's just so difficult to counter the messaging uh, that's coming from uh, these people who are preying on this community and people who are enabling them. Um, and I have to say that I, I I expected to see the rates of new cases reported drop because partly thanks to your effort and partly thanks to the leadership of some of these leaders within the Orthodox community, uh, rabbinic authorities and doctors, um, the number of people getting the MMR vaccine has increased significantly um, in the last few weeks in Williamsburg uh, and Borough Park, I believe. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, the number of new cases you reported this week went up. And I'm wondering if you can help me and, and the public understand what's happening here. We are seeing more people getting vaccinated, and we're not seeing the number of new cases drop. Can you help to uh, clarify that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so as I talked about when we declared the public health emergency, the, the challenge with measles is multifold. First and foremost, it is a highly contagious virus. So, you know, if you have a room where someone with measles enters and exit for the next two hours, 10 people with who are unvaccinated, enter that room, nine of them are gonna come out with measles, even though the person with measles left the room less than two hours ago. So that's how contagious it is. The second is that it has an incubation period that is as long as 21 days. And an individual can be infectious four days before they exhibit symptoms so that you know, sometimes with other illnesses, people say, I'm going to wait until I get the symptoms to then seek care. This is one of the situations where 
Um, once someone develops the system, you know, the, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak. And so that's why we have been placing so much emphasis on maximizing the number of individuals that get vaccinated. So we expected at that time for the next three to six weeks roughly for there to be ongoing transmission because as Dr. Daskalakis likes to say, and I really appreciate this sort of visual, it's kind of like a fractal, right? You have one individual who then comes in contact with other individuals and until such time that you, know, you document their immunization status or they get immunized, they are then potentials for further spread. And that's what we have seen in Williamsburg. Um, and so um, I am very cautiously optimistic that we will start seeing a slowdown soon, but I think it's a situation where, again, I, I go back to what I said earlier, that we can't take for granted that just because we're slowing down, it means that it's over. It's not over until it's completely over and we're not gonna stop. We are gonna remain as aggressive as we have been. We need parents, schools, and the medical community to continue doing their part in ensuring that we don't have young babies, pregnant mothers, people with cancer affected with measles. That is just inexcusable. Agreed, and, and Commissioner Daskalakis, or Dr. Daskalakis has been amazing on this issue, uh, like every other issue, and there's one point that he's helped me understand, which the public is missing, and it bears repeating. 3% of the population cannot be inoculated for whatever biological reason. The only way to protect those 3% is if everybody else gets the vaccination. And so, Parents who are not vaccinating their kids are not only jeopardizing the health of their kids, but they're jeopardizing the health of that 3% who, even though they want to get the vaccine, will not get the benefit. Uh, it, it's really, it's an offensive act against other people in the city. It's an aggressive act against other innocent kids in the city. Um, it's why this is really a special case. We just cannot let people off the hook who are not only ignoring science in a way that hurts their own kids, but are ignoring science in a way that hurts the children of other families in the city who themselves are trying to do the right thing. Um, I do want to move on. I know you agree with that, but that's Absolutely. a point that bears repeating. Um, one, one of the great pleasures of, of, of chairing the health committee is getting to know your phenomenal workforce. Um, uh, I think it's 7,000 strong. I, I don't know, what, what's the exact head count at this point? About 6,500. Okay. Um, and I mean, th th these are, are women and men who are, who are just incredibly dedicated professionals who are keeping the city safe. Um, and uh, a few of them are, are on the front lines of some of the issues we're talking about today. Um, certainly the nurses, uh, which I guess is local 436. Um, and I think the president is here, uh, Nurse Arroyo. Very nice to see you. And um, another union I've talked a lot about, another local I've talked a lot about, about some, some uh, uh, v very current issues is Local uh, 768, uh, uh, Fitz Reed is the president. Have you met with them or other leaders of unions that uh, are represented in, in your agency since you began your tenure? I have not. Will you meet with them? Would you meet with them? I'm always open to having meetings. They are amazing leaders. <laughs> I think that you would, I think that you could and should, and that you would find it to be very productive. Um, I think you guys have a lot to discuss. Um, on, on the NYC care, which uh, uh, as, as we've discussed here, is a program to help undocumented immigrants get primary care, uh, something I strongly support. Um, this was a concept piloted uh, by your agency in 2015 under a pilot called um, Action Health NYC. It was evaluated. It was not surprisingly shown to be impactful, to have real health benefits for uh, the New Yorkers who received primary care, um, despite the fact that they did not have insurance. 
Um, and the design of the program in the pilot was that most of the providers were community-based, nonprofit, CBOs, federally qualified health centers that are embedded in the communities that we're trying to reach. And NYC Care's currently designed cuts those providers out. It's exclusively offered within the H&H &H system. Uh, and so I, I actually regret that it's not the health department that's playing a coordinating role so that you can bring in providers that are, are beyond the public hospitals that really are, are just ideally attuned to the needs of immigrant communities. And wh what is your understanding of why the health department is not in the lead on this program and why the community-based FQHCs are not, um, what, and why people who enroll cannot get services out of the FQHCs that I mentioned? So I will answer part of that, but part of it I will need to defer to Dr. Katz because this is a, an H&H &H initiative. And I will say that when we piloted Action Health, as when we pilot a number of different things, it's to get a better sense of what has the potential to work, what has, what doesn't have potential to work, what are the lessons learned that we can implement to make whatever the next iteration needs to be as successful as possible. And uh, you know, I think that the, that pilot did that job the way that it was supposed to do. And so one of the issues identified through the initial pilot was the importance of care management. And that is one of the central components of NYC care through H&H. &H. And so I'm pleased that we in the health department were able to contribute you know, that component to that model. And uh, we are always open to continuing uh, collaborating with our sister agencies. But I would defer um, further questions about NYC care to Dr. Katz. OK. Um, I, I want to very quickly, to just, just to two more questions, because I want to pass it on to my colleagues. Um, we are in the midst of an opioid epidemic. I, I know you're aware of this, but it hasn't gone away. It's fallen out of the headlines for reasons I don't understand, but we're still losing um, three, four people a day to this epidemic. That is more than the number of people we lose from homicide, suicides, and traffic crashes together, uh, just to give you a sense of the scale of this, this, this epidemic. Um, and we as the city council, certainly myself as chair of the health committee, believe we need ever more aggressive, more innovative interventions to rein this crisis in. One of which is the safe injection site model, often called an overdose prevention center model. And uh, to the credit of, of the mayor, and I know the health department supported it, um, the city put forward a plan to open four of these as a pilot. We're waiting on approval from the state from the State Health Department. I hope that's coming soon. I don't know when it's coming. I hope it's coming very soon because people are dying. But when it does come, I want us to be able to turn on a dime and get these centers open. I don't want us to wait another day if we can avoid it because um, the stakes are very high. And I want the money to be in place so that we don't have to, on top of everything else, all these bureaucratic uh, hurdles we've had to surmount, we don't have to wait for the money to be produced. So uh, the city council put in its budget, res budget response the assertion that the administration should fund this now. We understand we're waiting for state approval. But it's not a lot of money. Uh, I forget the exact number. Uh, I think it's about $2 million um, that we want in the budget now so that we can immediately on a dime get these uh, programs up and running. Why not put that in the budget while we anticipate the approval coming from the State Health Department. So Mr. Chair, as you mentioned, this is an ongoing uh, issue priority for us. And uh, we continue to be uh, laser focused on turning the tide on the number of people that die as a result of opioid related overdoses. And we have a very comprehensive approach to uh, addressing the various components in that continuum that unfortunately uh, way too often lead to someone dying as a result of an overdose. 
I think the issue related to the opioid prevention centers, uh, as you note, we are waiting for uh, state approval to move forward on that. And I would argue that uh, we are working very closely with our partners to ensure that we are ready to turn on a dime and our partners have been actively uh, gathering private dollars to support those centers so that we as a city don't lose a beat when we finally get notification from the state. Okay, um, we're gonna keep pushing on that because of the stakes being as high as they are. Final question, you uh, are aggressively expanding your inspection of apartments where children have tested positive for lead poisoning and where, where needed, you are issuing uh, what are known as commissioner's orders to abate. Uh, I, I just want to understand the extent to which you've allocated more staff or more resources to that work as you've expanded that and whether uh, you're confident that you have adequate resources um, as the city is ramping up this in a push to finally eradicate lead poisoning. So on that, I am pleased to report that as a result of the ongoing efforts of the health department in collaboration with our sister agencies, that 2018 saw 600 fewer children with elevated blood lead levels as a result uh, and compared to 2017. And so with regards to the additional inspections that we're doing, I'm pleased to note that we are staffed up with EPA certified inspectors. Um, because of the uh, length of time that it takes to become certified, there's a bit of a lag in terms of when they will all become um, certified and I'll defer to, uh, I almost called you doctor, but you should be because you <laughs> know as much. Um, Deputy Commissioner Schiff uh, on the details of that. So we are scaled up with the uh, inspectors. We've got nurses on board. We've got equipment going. And so the good news is that we anticipate that by this summer, um, all children uh, who have had elevated blood lead levels will have uh, inspections done of their homes and uh, I want to take this opportunity to remind anyone who may be listening that if uh, families have peeling paint they can call 311 and uh, an inspector will go out in the meantime so uh, we are and have been aggressively tackling this and as I mentioned um, we're seeing the dividends in terms of fewer children being exposed to lead which is the bottom line. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we're going to go to Chair Ayala now. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I wanted to just clarify. So you stated the next year's uh, Thrive budget is $124 million. But at the, the Thrive hearing, uh, it was mentioned that the, the budget for next year would be 250. Now, the council, in the council's response, we asked for 50 million in cuts, but only nine were uh, identified um, for next year. So that still leaves roughly about $117 million. Is that additional savings or is that a mistake? So the 124 is just the health department's budget, the, the part of Thrive that goes to the health department. It's not all of Thrive. Got you. Thank you. That, I, I, thank you for clarifying that. Um, in the uh, in the, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's budget, uh, we're, we're seeing an increase in fiscal year 2020. However, there's a 3.1 percent de million dollar decrease to developmental disabilities budget. Um, can you explain why the reduction in, in a budget that's so so minimal to start with? So. Um let me start by saying that much of the resources that come to the city for um, individuals with developmental disabilities come directly through the state. And so the dollars that are in our budget are to supplement that. I think that particular reduction that you are referring to is a result of um, contracts with vendors not, council not being signed. So was there an increase Excuse in the me, state allocated. budget? Um, I'm going to let uh, Deputy Raza speak more directly to that. The reduction that you're referring to is actually the council contracts that are not in our fiscal year 20 budget yet. Okay. The, 
regarding the consumer directed uh, personal assistance program, the state's enacted budget cuts the consumer directed personal assistance program by 17%. This program provides funding for home health aides that assist elderly and disabled in the communities uh, like mine that I represent. Um, without this funding, there will be a significant decline in services provided by home health aides. Is there a plan to make up for the reduction of funding for the home health care? So I'll start, and then if we need to, we'll ask uh, Dr. Cunnins for uh, additional information. But I believe this particular um, area is more relevant to HRA. Mm. Now, last year, the mayor announced the Bronx plan to combat the opioid epidemic in the South Bronx. They, well, in the Bronx in general, but specifically in the South Bronx, where we had seen an increase in opioid-related uh, deaths. Is that was that a one-shot deal? Is that is that has that money been allocated uh, for next year? Because the money was announced, the funding was announced in November. I'm assuming that there's a, t a period right where we're kind of figuring out whether or not whatever resources are being funded with this money are actually working. So where where are we first of all with um, with the program? Uh, where, how have the funds been used so far? And is there an intention to add the, an additional? Uh, eight, nine million uh, to next year's budget. So I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Cunnins who will need to be sworn in. Um, let me begin by saying that um, as I alluded to earlier, we are taking a uh, multifold approach to ensuring that we accelerate the degree to which we're saving lives of people that are uh, dying because of opioids. And one of those approaches is to take a more place-based approach and bring services to individuals in a more coordinated fashion. And that's what we are um, seeing through the Bronx plan. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cunnins to give you the specifics about how um, that's being played out. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Ayala, for that question. Most of the initiatives in the Bronx plan are will be ongoing and are part of the incorporated into the budget uh, that you have uh, in front of you. So these include the HEAT uh, health engagement and assessment teams, uh, the uh, expansion of relay, which is the emergency department based non fatal overdose, deploying peer workers. This is now active at Bronx Care as well as um, St. Barnabas. Expansion of our primary care based buprenorphine program that will be ongoing. The, the, I'm sorry, um, Hillary, the, 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 uh, the peer workers, uh, you cited Bronx Care and St. Barnabas, not Lincoln? So at Lincoln, so uh, at Health and Hospitals, there is an, a sort of parallel uh, emergency department-based program also with peer workers and also uh, support for people who are hospitalized. You may have heard about that uh, under the rubric, the CATCH team, mm -hmm. that's the inpatient consultation service, and that is also up and running at Lincoln as part of the Bronx plan, though not administered by the health department. Um, we are um, also added uh, funding to the South Bronx-based uh, syringe service programs to expand outreach, uh, including to targeted areas in the South Bronx, including parks, to engage people who might need help. That will be on, that expanded funding is ongoing and not just one time. Um, uh, I'll also highlight the uh, expanded syringe cleanup program, which is also ongoing. Part of that sits in the health department to provide, again, additional outreach and uh, participant education around safer syringe disposal, as well as additional syringe cleanup, and that's funding that sits in the parks department. So of the, it was, was it eight or nine million? I always get it confused. I believe it was eight million. Eight million, so of the eight million that was allocated for fiscal year 19, is the entire eight million anticipated to come back? Okay, that's, that's actually wonderful news. Um, have we, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that it's still too soon to tell what the, 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 is, it, is, it, is the data showing that there's been a reduction in number of emergency room visits? 
So we're not, I, let me, uh, just to be clear, we're aiming both to reduce overdose deaths yes. um, by intervening in emergency departments, by increasing use of uh, treatment services, buprenorphine and others, as well as engaging people who might be out of doors, not ready to come into care in risk reduction. So I think our ultimate, me ultimate metric is overdose deaths, which is so, so, too soon to tell. I think interim metrics like increasing use of buprenorphine is going in the right direction. I think we are measuring and hearing reports of syringe litter, uh, which has gone down based on some of the interventions, and sort of numbers of contacts with people in community where information and engagement happens, and those numbers of contacts have, have gone up. So we, we, we have seen a reduction in the uh, improperly disposed of needles in some parts of the, of the South Bronx. However, we've seen that some of those, uh, those issues have been just relocated to other parts of the South Bronx. Is there some sort of public awareness campaign, uh, specifically in the public parks, that would direct uh, individuals uh, to, to contact a specific number if they find needles that, that are, you know, are being improperly disposed of because we've been getting inundated with uh, calls and emails um, just redirecting us to, to, you know, park and open spaces that, you know, were not being used last summer. So there is some informational material, uh, and I'll need to check on the status of where it's been deployed that uh, sort of reviews safe disposal of syringes, kiosk use, and where to go for if you see dis improperly discarded syringes. There's also ongoing work with the Bronx Task Force that's being led by both uh, Parks Department and the Health Department with community partners. Our goal is to be able to respond if there's new issues in other, in other areas and to, to be able to redeploy or move resources as needed. Yeah, I think it would be helpful, even if even if there was signage, uh, you know, in these public spaces where we know that these things are happening, that people would, you know, could just be directed, hey, if you're seeing this, please contact this number, contact this agency. I totally, I totally agree, and we'll get back to you about the status. All right. Now, in regards to the funding for the Cure Violence uh, Program, that funding, my understanding is, was transferred from Health and Hospitals to QHMH. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Thanks. Funding for the Cure Violence Program? Yes. It was transferred over from HMH to the OHMH. Yes. Okay. Um, how how long ago was it transferred? Um, I believe this past fiscal year. It's part of the exec plan, and it takes effect January, July first. Okay. Um, I only asked because some of my questions were really around metrics, and I don't think that you would have the capacity to really answer that uh, yeah. today. But. Um, I, I guess my, you know, my question is, and I I'll pretty much then I guess it would be an observation um, in regards to the uh, success of the mobile crisis vans that we were really excited about in last year's fiscal budget. There was, uh, it, there was funding for, I believe, two new uh, mobile vans that would be dispatched in the event of an emergency. So if there was a shooting response, um, they would be dispatched. And I haven't, we haven't really heard anything about, you know, the, this program. I haven't, I personally haven't seen any in, 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 in my district. I don't know, I haven't heard from any of my colleagues that they have either, so I wonder is it that the program hasn't started yet? If it ha so, um, Councilwoman, I will have to defer to MockJ for that specific response because they are um, overseeing programmatically. Okay, all right. I will turn it over to your chair. Thank you. We have been joined or were joined by council members Eugene, Joanie Powers, Cohen, Cabrera, Amphrey Samuel, Barron, and Gibson. And we now have questions from council member Holden followed by council member Joanie. Thank you, chair. Um, Commissioner, I see that you're in fiscal year 2020 going to reduce the uh, media spending 440,000. Is that gonna hurt outreach? So the media spending, um, we are, I don't think it's going to necessarily hurt it because we haven't yet decided which particular campaigns to um, target. I think there are a number of different ways in which we do outreach. Obviously, I would always want to be able to do more, but in these times, 
we are looking to minimize the impact of direct services to New Yorkers. And so that's but the- But here you have the measles outbreak, you have the opioid crisis going, lead, everything else that, and I think the weakest area of the city is the outreach in reaching the, the population to, um, to address some of these uh, needs and just the education. So I don't see, I, I, I think we should be increasing the media and uh, increasing the outreach, certainly. Um, I should see ads on bus shelters all over the neighborhoods that are affected by this, by anything, by the measles outbreak. Well, so for the and measles I'm not outbreak, that yet. Um, we do have a targeted uh, media campaign that's going to be going up in Williamsburg at bus kiosks at uh, a number of different brick and mortar places, if you will. We're also leveraging our presence on social media. Um, so there are a number of different ways in which we continue outreach. Um, and I don't anticipate that this will take away from um, obviously things like measles. We, like I said earlier, we will need to look at the portfolio of activities for which we do media to see where it is that we can minimize uh, any uh, unintended consequences. Yeah, I understand social media is one outlet to, to use, or, but I, again, I just lost two young people to, to the opioid crisis this week in my neighborhood. And I'm not seeing the outreach in my sector, I'm not seeing it in my district as much as maybe some other neighborhoods, but we're losing a lot of uh, young people. So um, I'd like I to work I don't anticipate uh, shying away from media related to the opioid epidemic. Right. Um, just a couple of things on the measles uh, outbreak. Does the weather affect, going into the summer months, do you expect it, you know, just if you did nothing else, you th does the weather, the humidity affect the, the measles virus? You know, typically um, measles is not transmitted the way, for example, you would think of the flu virus being transmitted. It's a very uh, highly infectious um, uh, virus, and so we are focused on ensuring that A, people get the information and making it easy for people to be vaccinated. I don't anticipate um, changes necessarily. What we're finding is that this is not just a U.S. or a New York City issue. You know, there are outbreaks happening in 23 other states. We're also seeing outbreaks happening in different parts of the world, and oftentimes we get cases that uh, get imported to the city. And again, the important thing is that we've got tremendous staff that identify those individuals as they come in. They do the contact tracing that we call in terms of, you know, at ensuring that the people that those individuals come in contact with are up to date on their immunization status so that we don't see ongoing transmission. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Joe and I followed by Powers. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, I just, Commissioner, if we can follow up a bit on the reduced media spending, um, and I'm going to echo some of the co comments that were made in reference to the importance of outreach. I grew up, and many of us recall, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, uh, the scared straight uh, mindset, um, which was in the home and the living room of every family out there. Why would we cut funding when it's needed more now than ever before? And that is to prevent our children from ever experimenting. So as I said earlier, we will take a comprehensive view of the various areas in which we do uh, media outreach. Um, we are always uh, applying for state and federal dollars that can include uh, budget allocation for media spending. So um, for the time being, uh, as a way to minimize direct service impact to New Yorkers, we are uh, utilizing this approach as a way to maximize direct services that remain for New Yorkers. But direct services, the idea is to prevent ever experimenting. And the message out there that everyone should be exposed to is don't start. 
And like I said, we're not looking to back away from uh, media outreach on opioids or other high priority items. I think that we will need to take a measured approach about how to um, best absorb let, let that. Let me ask you, what is the total spending for media? Um, for FY20, and I'm gonna ask uh, acting Associate Commissioner Canelo. While, while they look that up, it, the overdose prevention centers, is that the safe injection sites that we're referring to, is that the same? Opioid prevention centers will be places where individuals will have access to a variety of services to help them um, reduce the likelihood of, I think we're good. Think That's we're not good. the same as the reduce tents, the safe injection site tents? Um, we are, opioid prevention centers will be brick and mortar places where individuals can go to to receive a variety of services to reduce the likelihood that they may succumb to an opioid overdose or an overdose from any other particular type of drug. But that's not, is that where they're allowed to use opioids? So um, we are looking at these, um, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Cunnins to come up. Um, we are looking at these, as I say, as places where we will do what we call harm reduction services. So it may be a variety of syringe uh, exchange programs, connections Will anyone be to able care? to use illegal opioids under the overdose prevention centers? That's my question, specific. So I think you're getting at a hard question and the answer is yes in the models in Europe and in Canada where they've been found to be effective at saving people's lives. At this point... Oh, well, saving people's lives means preventing them from ever experimenting. That would be saving lives. That would be where we should be focused on, getting the education out there that never start, don't experiment, don't try. It's going to take you down a path you don't want to go. That would be the real focus. We're losing children and destroying families. I don't need a safe site for them to be able to shoot up. I need to give them the education to never start. So, Council Member, I, I think that certainly that is one component of how we can work towards reducing the number of people that um, succumb to addiction, but the reality is that um, it's a chronic disease, and I think that we need to have all approaches available to us on the table so that we meet people where they are, because the bottom line here is how we as a city can maximize the number of people that are thriving in their communities. Ma'am, I, I have two boys at home, and I'm no different than any other parent. An 18 and a 20 year old, and each day, I worry about what decisions they're gonna make that can take them down a path where they can become dependent on a substance. If I'm thinking that of my own family, I owe it to every New Yorker to be thinking the same way for their children, and that is give them all the information that they need to never experiment, which takes me into what was the budget for media spending that we're cutting 440000 from? So currently the amount of uh, media budget that we have for is 19.9 million dollars and like i said we have no intention of backing away uh, on the media coverage that we have for opioids i think we will need to be taking a very judicious look at the variety of topics that are covered um, but we need to meet our savings Come on, well we have plenty of other places to save and it shouldn't be in this arena this is where we should be putting additional resources. It's a, a, a dollar spent wisely. Um, and I'm sure in a 90 plus billion dollar budget, that's the one area that we should not be cutting from. Uh, what about educating in classrooms? What about taking it to elementary schools, educating our children on not only drugs and the effects of them and how experimenting and uh, 
by bringing in a scared straight program or the just something as common sense as when you should use an emergency room versus a primary care physician. We should be investing in our next generation while dealing with the needs of this current generation to prevent some of the paths that have been taken. Where are we? This is DOH. Can we, you could be in every classroom. It's one million school children you have access to. That's one million families. Yeah, so um, I, just, I just want to express how strongly we also feel about prevention and, and wherever possible to prevent uh, people uh, from ever using drugs or increasing an atmosphere where they're more likely to use. I think a couple examples of the, from the administration that I'll highlight is the recent executive order to ban alcohol advertising on city property. We know that young people exposed to alcohol advertising are more likely to consume alcohol at a younger age and to consume more alcohol. The other thing I'll highlight is we work closely with the Department of Education and in fact, uh, based on a council bill that was passed last year, we develop uh, materials for middle school and high school students around preventing. We've lost them at that age. We need them in elementary schools. There are 10 year olders out there that see this in their everyday lives, in parks, in recreational centers. Much earlier, and I, I, I thank you, Chair, for the discretion, but this is our future. And we see the impacts that we're having on the opioid addictions and the substance abuse that's out there. And they're starting at a much earlier age because they're exposed to it at a much earlier age. High school, they're gone already. They've experimented. They're there. I need you to help bring more awareness at a much earlier age where we can have that sponge, that brain that absorbs so much, not only understand the impact, but be able to take that message home and deliver it to the rest of their family members. That would be smart investing. Understood, and we'll remain committed to that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two people left, pa uh, Council Member Powers and then Gibson. Thank you. I had a few questions, but I wanted to pick up right where we left off on that topic. And I, I certainly agree with the council members around the need for strong uh, early prevention uh, in all levels of schooling and things like that. I mean, this echoes to me, though, the conversation that happened, I think, when Bloomberg was mayor around uh, needle exchange and some similar controversy around whether it allowed or not. And I think that the evidence has been overwhelming in the fact that it saved lives. And I think that um, one of the, to his credit, to Mayor Bloomberg and the Department of Health and others that that was a politically difficult thing to do I think at the moment and I think they did it and saved lives it prevented HIV transmission it gave people a safer place to do something that they were addicted to and that it was a, um, a successful endeavor by almost any measure and while I agree with my colleagues that they um, investing in media and outreach is a part important part of this we have to have a recognition that people will be addicted and when they are we have to have uh, services in place for them and I think um, the city would be wise to continue those efforts uh, with regard to uh, providing people who do have uh, addiction with, uh, with safe places to be able to receive services and treatment, recognize when they overdose, and prevent and lower um, things like HIV transmission that can result from that. Um, with, with, with that being my lead-in, um, I actually did have a question here about, um, I know that this was discussed last year, the overdose prevention centers and expanding them, or in, I think, four locations, one in Manhattan, one in the Bronx, I figure what maybe maybe one in other boroughs. Um, are, are they up and running, or, or I know there was. Do, do we need state authority for them, or what is the status of those? So we need state authority in order to have them be operational. We're working with partners to uh, ensure that when we get word from the state, that we'll be able to uh, maximize the time and, as we say, hit the ground running. Um, and so we, in the meantime, as you alluded to, are fully leveraging all of the other initiatives that we have in place to address the continuum that contribute to people becoming uh, addicted. So for example, there is a significant amount of work that we are doing with the healthcare provider community to ensure 
judicious prescribing, um, as well as increasing the number of physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants that are able to prescribe buprenorphine throughout the city. We've increased that by 1,500. And so um, it's a full approach to this ongoing issue. Okay, and just picking up on that, um, can you talk just, I, I think we've raised, I raised this in another hearing, but the, pres the prescribing of painkillers, which then can create an addiction. Um, it's been well documented. I think there was a, there was a, I think it was in the New York Times recently, a, a one focus on one particular small community where the, the, pre the prescription rate was through the roof. Um, but, and I know other cities have looked at things around prescri prescribing and ways to um, uh, track and monitor um, areas where there might be uh, over, prescription, over prescribing happening, potentially something illegal. Can you tell us what we're doing here in New York City and other things that we're looking at that you're considering around uh, opioid abuse and ways to track prescriptions uh, that, may, that may lead and feed into that? So I'm going to have Dr. Cunnins um, address this because she and her team have done uh, a significant amount of work in this particular area. So this has been a really important component of our prevention-oriented work. That is, if you uh, reduce the unnecessary opioid prescriptions, the idea here is to minimize uh, risk of developing addiction, whether it's a prescription for a wisdom tooth extraction, a sports injury, and so forth. So we've been uh, have issued guidance to primary care physicians. Our guidance actually predates the CDC guidance, which has garnered a lot of national attention. We've issued other guidance around specific kinds of prescribing that increase risk of overdose. For example, prescribing an opioid along with another substance called a benzodiazepine, which is things like Valium or Xanax, which increases risk of overdose. We've spread that message uh, uh, in a number of ways, including going door-to-door so-called public health detailing in areas where we know through data there are higher than average rates of opioid prescribing in the city. And our evaluation data shows that that approach, one-to-one uh, -one brief visits, changes uh, prescribing practices towards safer uh, strategies. Okay, and I, well, at some point we'll have follow-up questions on but um, just my last question in respect to time. Um, obviously, with the conversation going on around about reproductive health in other states right now and what's happening throughout the country, there's been, um, you know, even recently in light of that, some groups calling for increased funding around reproductive access and health in New York City. And I'm wondering, in light of, it, of, of what's happening and very recent stuff in Alabama and other states, whether the city is considered in this budget adding more funding in around reproductive health um, uh, in, in order to address what is sort of a, a uh, you know, concerning uh, trend in other states in New York City and how we may be able to, you know, improve access here in New York City. As an administration, we remain committed to ensuring that uh, we do, uh, we continue women's access to high quality uh, health care, inclu including reproductive health care and abortion being part of that. Uh, we are paying close attention to what's happening across the country and we are in uh, close communication with our partners across the city uh, to see what could be the best way forward, um, but those conversations I think are still evolving. Okay, and but has the mayor recommended putting more funding into those issues in this year's budget, either in response or to, or in correlation to what's happening in other states? I, I haven't been a part of those conversations, but within the health department, we are focused on ensuring that we maximize all the services that we provide through our sexual health clinics um, to all New Yorkers, and certainly maintaining communications and collaborations with healthcare providers throughout the community. Okay, we'll continue the conversation on more funding, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. And I would like to ask, is Councilmember Gibson, yes? Uh, 
paper. Thank you. Thank you to Chair Drum and Chair Levine and Chair Ayala. Good afternoon, Commissioner, and congratulations officially on your appointment. Thank um, you. I've worked very closely with DOHMH uh, with you under your previous capacity and certainly appreciate the partnership. Um, obviously, our aggressive action during times of great challenge during the measles outbreak, the Legionnaires and others, uh, the Ebola crisis that we had predominantly in the Bronx, um, DOHMH has always been there, so I really want to thank you for that. Um, I appreciate Chair Drum asked the question because I really wanted to make sure we emphasize the important need for school nurses um, and not necessarily distinguishing between a DOE school nurse and a DOHMH nurse, but the fact that nurses are providing the critical health care services that many of our schools need, as well as the school-based health centers that we are constantly expanding. Um, I really appreciate that work. So I wanted to ask a few questions, and when I served in the State Assembly and now in the Council, one of my priorities has always been the Nurse Family Partnership Program, um, working with organizations like Visiting Nurse Service and others. I um, really appreciate the work they do working with uh, young mothers and families, and in our budget response, we called on an additional $1 million to bring the program from $4 million to $5 million. so I wanted your thoughts on that. And then secondly, I wanted to ask specifically Chair Ayala and many members of the Women's Caucus, we have been very, very passionate about maternal health care, about doulas, about focusing on expecting mothers, pre-birth, post-birth, and just all of the health and wraparound services that new mothers require. And so I wanted to ask specifically, uh, within DOHMH, what programs are we looking at? How much money are we talking about when you talk about maternal? health care and specifically doulas and I'm sure you are aware that we have a high infant mortality rate predominantly in the African-American community and so that's concerning for me as well so I wanted to get your thoughts on that and what the council can do this budget season to be helpful in these efforts. Thank you for that question and thank you for your support of the health department. Our, our relationship has been very strong for a number of years, and I want to thank you for that. I guess I'll start with your second question first in terms of what we're doing with regards to um, sort of the, the whole package related to maternal care and infant mortality, because certainly they're part of that same continuum. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, a, an area of passion that I've had for my entire career, both um, in this city and, and while I was a pediatrician and in other cities where I've been a, a public health leader. I think that um, first and foremost, in terms of your question around doulas, uh, the health department has been a leader in promoting the importance of doulas. Um, and we began that in central Brooklyn a number of years ago. Um, most recently, our efforts have really focused on the state level in terms of really highlighting the notion that in order to get to critical mass that's sustainable, we need to ensure that doula services are reimbursable at an appropriate rate. Um, and so we are focused on that, we're not gonna give that up because we see that as a critical component to the services that we are interested in seeing with regards to improving maternal mortality as well as infant mortality. The other thing in terms of your question related to the nurse family partnership, I wanna really um, be strong in my thank you to the council for their ongoing support for NFP because mm -hmm. this program has been um, a part of the health department for many, many years. And um, I wanna thank you for your support and we are in ongoing conversations with OMB about the program. That being said, we are also focused on how it is that we can further increase the number of opportunities to provide home visiting services to families. And so we are working with our community-based partners, looking at what are the evidence-based models that we can uh, increase capacity on. We are working with our partners in um, a number of different areas, including philanthropy, so that we as a city can have a coordinated 
approach to improving um, birth outcomes that include reducing the racial gap in infant mortality, as well as the racial gap in severe maternal morbidity and maternal mortality. And actually, the three-pronged approach that we're taking to that, one includes um, incorporating um, uh, the home environment and uh, housing into safe sleep uh, messages that we're putting together in collaboration with ACS. The second one is focusing on maternal health and the fact that uh, in partnership with our healthcare delivery partners, we look at uh, the health of women of reproductive reproductive age even before they become pregnant. We know that hypertension, obesity, and diabetes are major contributors to poor health outcomes. We are also working with our healthcare delivery partners on um, the implicit bias that is uh, sort of inherent in healthcare delivery systems and how we work with them to undo implicit bias uh, as a major underlying factor to poor uh, birth outcomes. We are currently um, in a cohort of uh, hospitals throughout the city looking at how we incorporate maternal morbidity scenarios into the trainings that they do for their doctors and nurses in terms of dealing with emergencies. And then um, the third component, looking at the, the uh, aspects of uh, trauma and stress on underlying, uh, as underlying drivers to poor birth outcomes as well. Okay, uh, it sounds very extensive, and I certainly uh, urge you and encourage you to continue to work with us and all yes. of the interagency coordination. And Chair Levine, if I could just ask one final question, specifically because we've talked a lot about the AIDS epidemic and many other you know crises that we have. I also think we have to take a, a real focus on diabetes and diabetes prevention and heart disease and obesity and many of the you know ailments that we are predominantly faced with in low income communities of color, immigrant communities, and specifically for Bronx County, Councilmember Ayala and I um, work with many healthcare organizations, the school-based as well as the community-based health centers, all of the hospitals, and I really want to recognize the Bronx office, the Neighborhood Action Center. Dr. Jane Bedell is phenomenal. Agreed. Her and her team are amazing. Agreed. And we have a Bronx Public Health Task Force where we have the Not 62 campaign. And we don't look at it just from a health perspective. We look at it in a holistic way. So the parks, the open access, the walking, the biking, the jogging, the exercise, the fitness, all of that is relative for us in the Bronx because we honestly have to catch up. Um, our numbers are alarming every day, and we see it with obesity rates and so many other factors. And so I wanted to ask specifically, as it relates to diabetes, diabetes awareness and pre-screening, uh, many of us are pre-diabetic ourselves, and there's been an active campaign of advocates coming to us during this budget season asking for more of a priority on diabetes awareness. So I wanted your thoughts on that and if that's something that we could do together, and what would that look like if we develop more of a focus on diabetes awareness and prevention. So I appreciate that, and I again, I appreciate your support um, on the ground and the work that we're doing in the Bronx, and I couldn't agree with you more that Dr. Bedell is a rock star. <laughs> um, with um, specifically around diabetes, um, you know, the, the approach that we're taking to uh, address the issue of diabetes is twofold. One is on the prevention efforts and the other is on the control. Mm -hmm. And on the prevention efforts, we're looking at uh, issues related to nutrition, access to physical activity, and looking at how we can, as you alluded to, take an approach that um, looks, as we say, more upstream about how we can uh, work with our partners to influence the food environment so that healthy choices are more easily accessible um, and how we can look at things like exposure to media as a way to counter those messages of having uh, our youth think that it's you know a normal part of everyday life to drink soda every single day and so on. Additionally, on the control part, we're looking at ways in which we can prevent people from developing diabetes or even pre-diabetes. And one of the um, 
programmatic areas that we are focusing on is the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And we have um, worked extensively on increasing access to that evidence-based initiative. And actually, recently, the CDC re uh, released information where New York State is leading the country in terms of access to uh, the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And I'm proud to say that New York City accounts for 70% of that increased access. So, you know, as we always say, that we could always do more, but there is a fair amount that we are currently doing um, that we would be more than happy to talk with you more about to see how we can then take even further. Thank okay. you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you for your help. Really appreciate it. Thank and you. once again, the Bronx obviously at a greater, you know, disadvantage. We certainly need all the resources we can get. And I'm sure Dr. Bedell and her team could use more resources as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Levine. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Thank you, <laughs> Councilmember Gibbs, Gibson. And as long as we're shouting out outstanding leaders in neighborhood <laughs> health action centers, we are in the presence of Dr. Manyendo, who's here as well, uh, Assistant Commissioner, uh, who's doing Another a fabulous rock star. job. Uh, but I do want to make a serious point that uh, the recurring theme throughout this hearing has been the importance of on the ground community outreach and education. That's true for measles. Uh, opioid addiction, uh, HIV, AIDS, uh, viral hepatitis, um, and other topics we haven't really gotten in today related to heart disease and diets, et cetera. And that's the philosophy behind these neighborhood action centers. Um, they are something of, uh, of a legacy of the uh, Mayor LaGuardia era where, where he had 30 of these district health office, district public health offices. We're down to three now. We've got one in, in East Harlem, Harlem, one in the South Bronx, one in Brownsville. But they're neighborhoods from Washington Heights to uh, Rockaways or Jamaican Queens, North Shore of Staten Island, which certainly meet, the, I think, anyone's definition of, of communities which are facing severe public health challenges where they're under-resourced and where this kind of outreach would be very helpful. Um, so, does the health department have a plan to expand this model to other neighborhoods that uh, would benefit from it? So I want to thank you for recognizing the importance that our neighborhood health action centers currently play and have played uh, in communities. You know, I think the, the sad reality is that these are the very same communities that have been historically disinvested in, and the health department has been in those communities uh, intensively uh, the last 10 to 15 years. The reality is that we are currently uh, reevaluating the model to make sure that we are fully able to leverage all of the components of that model. Um, because it has been so successful, we think it can be even more successful. But it's only one of the ways in which we work on the ground, uh, shoulder to shoulder with our communities. There are a number of different additional ways that, that we do that work. And so we are always looking at the variety of ways in which we can maximize our presence uh, physically in communities. Okay. Uh... I'm not sure how to parse uh, that, but I'll say this is a budget hearing, and so it's worth mentioning it's a very uh, cost-effective effective intervention, partly because uh, it's magnified by CBOs who take up residence in these facilities, so the, the city only pays for relatively limited staff, um, although the public gets the benefit of, of services far beyond that. Uh, so to me, it's, it's actually a great investment and not an extravagant one, and one I'd like to see us expand to other communities in need. Um, I see we've been rejoined by our chair, and I think we're concluded, Mr. Chair, but I'll pass it back to you. I have two, just two quick questions uh, on Thrive. In addition to receiving an updated budget to Thrive, can you provide a breakdown as well? Uh, we received one for the preliminary budget. So we could do that for the dollars that's in the health department. Okay, thank you. And uh, diversion centers, what are the specific locations? Do you know the, uh, where they are specifically located? Um, 
We can follow up with you on those addresses. I don't know if we, yeah. We're trying to, we're just we're trying to, since we are being streamed, get the word out about where they are, et cetera, yeah. Okay, so you get back to us yes. on that, yep. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. Uh, this panel is now concluded, and I have to read a closing statement. So this concludes our hearing for today. The Finance Committee will resume executive budget hearings for fiscal 2020 tomorrow, Friday, May 17th, at 10 a.m. in the committee room next door. Tomorrow, the Finance Committee will hear from the Law Department, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the Board of Elections, and the Campaign Finance Board. As a, as a reminder, the public will be invited to testify on Thursday, May 23rd, the last day of budget hearings at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For any member of the public who wishes to testify but cannot make it to the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Thank you, and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you, Commissioner, for, being, for coming in and, and for talking with us. Thank you.